Ah, good day, mate. 40 here. All right, want to get get all my settings working. So let let's learn a little bit about the craft of writing effectively. It means you need to learn to tune in to the code that is used by those people who have power. So here's a lecture from the University of Chicago. While I double check my settings. Forget the letters and all that kind of stuff. Academic stuff. Order of magnitude. I don't know. 300? 300 texts, let's make it up. 500? 1,000? I don't know how many it is. We'll make it up. We'll make it up. 200. 200. 100. How about 100? She's better with 100. You've written 100 academic texts in your life. Did the reader stop reading them? Did they? No. Why not? They were grading it. Let's be a little more crude about it. They were paid. <laughs> oh my God, guys. Academics get all freaked out when I talk about money. I said, guys, I got news for you. Your teachers read your stuff because they were paid to what? Were your teachers reading your text to think about the world? Because they That's not what they're paid to do. Why were your teachers reading your text? Why were people paying them to do it? To change the way they see the world? No, why? Teachers read texts because they are paid to care about the students. You've learned to write in a system where you're writing to readers who are paid to care about you. That will stop. That will stop, right? That will stop. The rules that you've learned about writing were rules that were generated in a system where you are writing to somebody who's paid to care about you. That's over. In the real, in the world. So this, this has a lot of meaning for, for my podcast. If you want to have an effective podcast, if you want to be an effective writer, if you want to be effective in life in general, you have to think about your audience, right? You have to think about your employer, your, your clients, your audience. And so if you're going to do a podcast, you want to think about a particular audience and how you can meet its needs. And I don't do that. And that's a substantial reason why I am not more successful. Uh, I do a show that meets my needs, that, that goes where I want it to go. I don't think in terms of a specific audience of what it wants. Hence, that makes me a lot less effective. World beyond school, I'll call it a real world, but I'm not sure it's real. It's just the world beyond school. They're not paid to care about you. Why are they reading? Why are they reading your stuff? Why will they read it? The journals, your colleagues. Because they think it's relevant to their work. Because they think it's valuable to them. How much of student work is valuable to the faculty to which the students are writing? <laughs> and by the way, some faculty who Right, virtually none. All right, virtually none of student work is valuable to faculty. If you want to be a successful podcast, you have to turn to produce in terms of how valuable will this content be to your audience? Ah, so why do people tune into live streams? So part of it is spectacle, the, the drama. Uh, a substantial part of it is authenticity because so much of public commentary seems so incredibly contrived. For example, all the talk about democracy and is Trump a threat to democracy? And that, that is just not particularly rooted in reality because the same people who talk about Trump as a threat to democracy, they'll talk about how majoritarianism is a threat to democracy, meaning that if the majority of the country choose to go in a certain direction, such as restricting the rights of minorities, that that's a threat to democracy. So almost all the talk about threats to democracy is really a talk about threats to liberalism, which is the idea that we're all primarily individuals born with certain inalienable rights. And it's this kind of Whig version of history that uh, we're having a progressive unfolding of more and more human rights, more and more opportunities and protections for human flourishing, right? That's the individualist point of view. But if you look around 
the world, all right, almost all of it is run when it when push comes to shove on the basis of hierarchy. All right, business run on the basis of hierarchy. There's a CEO, and then there are people under him. Right, you have a boss. Right, your, your boss may or may not be open to your feedback, but there's a decider. Right, the president of the United States is the decider. The president of the United States has all the foreign policy powers of King George the Third with Britain. Right, he can send nuclear bombs to against foreign nations. He can assassinate people who aren't American citizens. Right, he has almost unlimited powers in terms of uh, starting wars or attacking and killing people overseas. So even much of the United States government is not run on the basis of hierarchy. The United States government contains elements of democracy, but we saw during COVID that all the inalienable rights that you took for granted, such as freedom of movement, freedom to assemble, freedom of religion, to practice your religion, got taken away like that in the name of an emergency, and typically under the name of emergency, all right, all your rights can just get uh, taken away. Uh, look at Israel, all right, after October 7. All right, Israel developed a war cabinet, and almost all its decisions are made by three people. And uh, you start to get some rumblings of discontent that uh, we've got this war cabinet, a body without any legal status is the one that is deciding the critical strategic question of going to war against Iran. That's a disturbing scandal, says Iran Etzion, former deputy head of Israel's National Security Council. But when push comes to shove, life usually gets run on the basis of hierarchy rather than democracy. So all these platitudes that take up a lot of uh, you know, public discussion, such as the threat of anti-Semitism on college campuses, right? Overwhelmingly, right, Jews on college campuses are in about the safest places they can be. Yeah, there is a lot of pushback against Zionism, right? There's a lot of pushback against the Jewish state, but... Jewish students are not getting beaten up, let alone killed, on college campuses. They're overwhelmingly safe. And yet what, what's dominating the news is, is the rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses. And you'll never hear a discussion of, of anti-Gentilism, right? Different groups have different interests. When group interests colla- clash, right, you'll, you'll see groups organizing their own interests. And sometimes that results in anti-Jewish organization. And sometimes that will result in Jews, if they dominate a particular sphere of life, they, they might organize to perpetuate their own interests, just like any other group will. So much of public dialogue is contrived, and so people turn to live stream to get more real talk. Right? There's a tremendous amount of discussion of Israel committing genocide in Gaza, and that, that uh, argument and that uh, discussion does not bother me, but it does seem to be overstated and somewhat contrived that when you compare the number of dead Hamas militants to the number of dead civilians, it appears that Israel is doing a better job than any other nation of which we know with regard to urban warfare and minimizing the deaths of civilians. But in in opposition to this kind of contrived, partially contrived uh, discussion of uh, Israeli genocide, right, we, get, uh, we get pushback in live streams, and that's why people turn to live streams to get more real talk. And some of it is done by people like Destiny, Steve Bennell. This is a famous clip of his from all the discussion over genocide in Gaza. Bridges being burned, like there's a there's a specific nomenclature with Destiny about like the bridges burning or bridges being mended, like feuding with different people and stuff. But it's it's not just Destiny that does this. It's kind of the whole uh, streamer ecosystem yeah and i think it's partly because of the the nature of the content means that one thing which people like to do is reaction videos you know like playing someone else's content and commenting on that and i think by the so we do chris so we do yeah yeah well we do all right so the latest edition of decoding the gurus is a focus on on destiny but you may be wondering why does all the discussion on live stream seem to have so little real world effect and that is knowledge is not something static, all right? Knowledge is a conversation that goes through time. This is the point made by the head of the University of uh, Chicago writing program here, uh, Larry McInerney. Is that correct? Yeah, Larry, McIn- Mc- Larry McInerney. And he, he says knowledge is this discussion through time. If you want to take part in this discussion of, of, of knowledge moving through time, 
you have to learn the code of the people who are thought to be the primary possessors of knowledge. So if you want to have an effect on elite discourse, all right, you have to learn the code of the elites in your area, right? So this is primarily talking about the social sciences and the humanities, things like, like politics, right? There's a particular code that the elite speak. And if you want to be effective, you have to adopt that code, right? You can't just talking about, talk about dropping loads and uh, saying that you're pro-genocide if you want to have some influence on elite discourse. So the video so it doesn't and like that that's the thing you know there's a difference to it one when you do it every day and oh no sound so how much was i i muted so i just gave you the secrets of the universe and nobody heard me bro still muted that's terrible all right if you want to have an effect on the real world you have to learn the code of the people who make the decisions in the real world so there will be an elite whether it's in the dental profession, the accounting profession, in the liberal arts, in uh, Finnish architecture, in foreign policy. All right, foreign policy is overwhelmingly decided by just a tiny number of people. We're going to go to a war. Sorry, you lost a minute. Man, that's one of the challenges of live streaming that uh, I, I've got all my settings right, but if, if I don't put enough emphasis occasionally on my words, then I, I just go mute. So I lost... I lost a minute. You have to learn to speak the code of the people who make real world decisions. And if you don't speak the code of the people who make real world decisions, you won't make uh, much of a difference in what's going on in the real world. And so this requires some self-discipline, right? It doesn't come naturally. You have to subjugate your own tendencies and desires to those who make the decisions all right this is but I discussion here thoughts because uh, there's too many destiny fans that are watching my videos and i need to shoo them away so let's defend jordan peterson on every single thing he says first you have to think that jordan peterson did some armchair psychoanalysis on destiny i'm sure someone from peterson's staff sent jordan peterson all of like destiny's worst clips or the conversation he had with dr k and dr k asked him if he's a sociopath so jordan peterson is like really i think got a conception of who destiny is and it's a very uh, nuanced battle battle of, you know, Adderall versus Benzos. So it's, I think it's fun. So was there a game-like element to the debating, do you think? And, and is that part of, is that part of why that morphing made sense? No, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> I mean, if you... He's asking how he got started in streaming. And right off the bat, Jordan Pearson's like, so it's a game. You play games. Do you treat debates like a game? Which I think Destiny definitely does. Not necessarily that that's bad. I certainly do that as well. I make League of Legends videos related to politics. But it's funny how he rejects the framing, which is, you know, a good move, but he kind of accepts it. And I do agree with him that you can just define game to mean anything. And if you get really reductionist, everything in life is kind of a game, but that's not very satisfying. Uh, I think I grew up like very argumentative. My mm -hmm. mom is from Cuba, so my family- Yeah, we know that. Okay, this is Peterson's critique of climate change that I believe is logical, but I haven't verified. And those are not the same thing. It's logical if the facts are true, but I don't know if the facts are true. So listen, I will go on a climate change arc at some point, investigate this further, but let's listen to the argument. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet I, just I think that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature uh, 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 detection sites were first put outside urban areas. And then as and the, right, and then you have to correct, then you have to correct for the 
for the movement of the urban areas. And then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature. So Jordan Peterson talks about that he's read 200 books on climate change. So I'm skeptical of of that claim, and I'm skeptical of Jordan's claims here. ...that you're planning to measure. Okay, if that's true, which I don't know if it is or not, then that's point for Peterson, straight up. This isn't data. This is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're going to save the poor in the future. It's like, that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed okay. a lot of people doing it. And okay. we're walking... Okay, let's, we'll get into that in a second. I don't think they... Yeah, so Jordan sounds unhinged here, a little bit like uh, Tucker Carlson, increasingly sounding unhinged over the past few years. He's, he's talked about uh, extraterrestrials. He, he believes that U.S. servicemen have died as a result of uh, extraterrestrials. Servicemen have died as a result of contact with or being in the proximity of these vehicles and we know that because there are a lot of suits working their way through the va system yeah i mean tucker has said that the cia killed john f kennedy how does he know that because one person in the know told him right we we can all claim that one person in the know told us something it's not exactly a strong empirical evidentiary basis for such a dramatic claim yeah so tucker is giving his audience what it wants to hear right there's an enormous audience for hearing about UFOs and for hearing about JFK conspiracy theories and vaccine conspiracy theories. And here he is on the Joe Rogan show. Uh, Joe Rogan, someone who has a vast overestimation of his own ability to detect what's right and wrong. I mean, Joe Rogan isn't even sure if we ever landed on the moon in 1969. Where families, you know, can't get compensated for the deaths or injuries to loved ones. Because that- it's all under wraps, top secret. Well, that's just that's just a fact, okay, that that is happening. So if there's, I guess, you know, when there are measurable physical effects of a phenomenon, we can say conclusively the phenomenon is real. Right. And um, so, yeah. But I mean, isn't it, it, is, it is real. I mean, I guess we're sort of past the point of like, is it real? Yeah, it's real. It's It's real in that there's these things that are moving in very bizarre ways and they have these propulsion systems that – violate what we know about propulsion systems. Um, and we know that there is a, a real effort and has been underway for a long time to to keep the public from knowing about it. But that's all known. That's established. I don't think any rational person would deny that. The question is, like, what is it, actually? I mean, now is sort of the point yeah. you have to ask, like, what is this? And, um, you know. So that's how much of it do you think is ours? Well, none of it's ours. None of it. Well, I don't know. I mean, clearly, you know, the U.S. government is huge. It's the largest human organization. There are, I think, then I think there are two million federal employees and another ten million federal contractors. So, who are effectively government employees, but don't. Uh, One thing I've learned from my experience as a reporter is that uh, a lot of people are unhinged in one area of life and yet brave truth tellers in other areas of life. The type of person who is willing to buck the conventional wisdom, all right, the type of person who's willing to go up against his own personal interest is also likely to be highly eccentric and unfortunately also likely to take some bizarre stances, right? Not just, you know, brave standing up for for truth, but then going unhinged because they lack the normal social cues. They lack the habitual obeisance to social cues that uh, keep many people on track. So once you start operating out where the buses don't run no more, like people like myself, right? I, I've been a kind of an outlaw blogger and, and vlogger for, uh, what, 27 years now, right? Once you start operating where the buses don't run no more, you are less susceptible to the normal social cues that keep people in line and that makes you much more vulnerable to becoming unhinged and you also become much more vulnerable to audience capture because you're not getting traditional social reinforcement for taking what what is thought to be a, a normal pro-social uh, perspective so once you've left polite society like let's say tucker carlson was ruled outside of polite society for his anti-immigration stance 
than Tucker Lee's Polite Society, many other people in distant areas of, of politics uh, leave polite society, then they don't get the normal social cues. They're not open to learning from from other people the way that uh, keeps most people in check. And then they start thinking of themselves as brave truth tellers. And then because they're not getting that social reinforcement from the polite people, they start getting social reinforcement from the people on the fringe of society. And that makes you more and more vulnerable to audience capture because this is the only place where you're consistently getting love and respect. And so you're more and more likely to start heading in a direction that the people who are loving you want you to go so you can get more of that love and more of that audience. Don't have civil service protection, for example. Um, so that's 12 million people in a country of 340 million working for the federal government. So it's kind of hard to overstate how big the federal government is and how well funded. And so to say the government this, the government that, no, of course, it's people within the government. Um, but yeah, they're working on all kinds of things, obviously, uh, that are classified. But in general, no, they they can't control these objects. Uh, so no, it's not American technology. Well, s- or Russian or Chinese. It predates, you know, all of that. Well, the, some of it does, right? Like for sure, the Kenneth Arnold sightings. That was really early on that was like the 19 early 1950s he was seeing these flying saucers these discs that were moving over mountains well right i mean the prophet ezekiel writes about it right. in the first chapter wheels in the sky yeah know, that's so. a crazy one boy when you well read it that, is crazy if you yeah. if you read it it's like oh wow yeah. you know and a so and a wheel. not just you know the hebrew scriptures like it's all over every mm-hmm. the vedic text of course mm-hmm. so these are spiritual phenomenon. There's no evidence they're from another planet. I mean, I think that's the op, that's the lie, that they're from Mars. Look, space, the atmosphere is really well monitored, right? Both for military, for defense reasons, but also because like, it'd be nice to know when asteroids are coming. And there's no evidence, has never been any evidence that there are lots of these objects, these vehicles coming into our atmosphere from somewhere else, some other planet. There's no evidence of that at all. Yeah, so when you say we're doing battle with with spiritual forces, obviously that can't be argued against, right? There's no empirical way to challenge that. It's hard to develop some strong logical philosophical argument against that, that there's not a right and wrong. What a loss to our discourse. Ultra Testosterone has lost his Twitter account, and it appears that uh, Laponius is not here either, are Laponius and Ultra Testosterone the same the same person? Man, ow, ow. we will not see their like again. I think I think we can all agree on that. All right. The increase in, in hungry people on the in the planet is because of climate policies. Why not? Think, because because I don't think that countries in Africa are being pushed away from fossil fuels. I mean, most developing countries. Of course, nations- they are. We don't have an increase in hungry people on the planet. We're having a steady decrease in the number of hungry people on the planet. They can't even get they can't even get loans from the World Bank to produce for pursue fossil fuel development. And there's plenty of African leaders who are screeching at the top of their lungs about that. Okay, this is 100 percent true, by the way. I watched this video over the next um, decade, two decades. It is. Uh, expected that there will be $150 billion worth of oil and gas extracted off your coast. It's an extraordinary figure, but think of it in practical terms. That means, according to many experts, more than 2 billion tonnes of carbon emissions will come from your seabed, from those reserves, and be released into the atmosphere. I I don't know if you as a head of state went to the COP in Dubai. Let me stop you right there. Do you know that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined? A forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon? A forest that we have kept alive? A forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, Does no, that no, no. give you the that, right to release that, that all of this right? carbon? Does from... that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change. So apparently the percentage of carbon in the atmosphere has, has doubled. That, that strikes me as significant.
exchange. Because we have kept this forest alive that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon that you enjoy, that the world enjoy, that you don't pay us for, that you don't value, that you don't see a value in, that the people of Guyana has kept alive. Guess what? We have the lowest deforestation rate in the world. And guess what? Even with our greatest exploration of the oil and gas resource we have now, we will still be uh, net zero. Guyana will still be net zero. With all our exploration, a couple of we'll points. still be net zero. No, no, pa there's no, no powerful, powerful no, no, words, no, no, no. Mr. President. Okay, so according to NASA, apparently, uh, since the 18th century, human activities have raised atmospheric carbon dioxide levels by 50%. So the amount of carbon dioxide is now 150% of its value in 1750. This human induced rise is greater than the natural increase observed at the end of the last ice age 20,000 years ago. So th there are strong arguments for climate change and there are arguments that can be made fairly simply. Uh, I, I don't, don't know enough about the topic to take any strong perspective. No, no, I, I'm not completed as yet. I am not finished as yet. I am just not finished as yet because this is the hypocrisy that exists in the world. We, the world in the last 50 years, has lost 65% of all its biodiversity. We have kept our biodiversity. Are you valuing it? Are you ready to pay for it? When is the developed world going well, to pay for it? Or are you, you in the pockets? You, are you in the pockets of those who have damaged the environment? Are you in the pockets, are you and your system in the pockets of those who destroyed the environment through the industrial revolution and now lecturing us? Are you in their pockets? Are you paid by them? Are you paid right, to keep right, their Mr. message? President. Okay, this is where Peterson, I think, uh, loses me a little bit. Let's say that everything you've said is true. What do you think is the plan then? What is the goal? What is the drive? Like, the why push, why push obviously horrible ideas for the planet and the poor? That's a good question. That's well, a good question. Well, because you're positing it, right? So what, what do you think is the driver goal? Well, I listen to what people say. So I think Destiny is, is very smart. He's got a similar IQ level, I would suspect, to Jordan Peterson. Hey, here's the most terrible thing they say. There are too many people on the planet. Okay, so who says that? I've heard people say that for 30 years. Perfectly ordinary, compassionate people. Well, there's too many people on the planet. And I think, well, for me, that's like hearing Satan himself take possession of their spine and, and move their mouth. That's ridiculous because that's a common phrase. People believe that. Bill Burr makes jokes about that unironically, like, all the time. Nobody has the balls to come out and say it and just say, look, 85% of you have to go. <laughs> that's it. I have been bitching about the population problem for three specials in a row. So I think this is a little out of touch from Peterson. If someone said, you know, there's too many people on the planet. I think that every time I'm in traffic, you know, it's like, that's the voice of Satan. Is it more consequential when the WEF is preventing developing nations from using fossil fuels? Sure, but this is what makes Jordan Peterson out of touch by saying, well, it's literally the voice of Satan when people say that. It's like, it's not. Okay, I think destiny gets the best. Right. When you say it's the voice of Satan, you don't have to engage, right? When you say this is demonic, you don't have to engage, right? You're taking the easy way out. To Jordan Peterson in this exchange. But nuclear energy is a totally viable alternative to other forms of Then fossil why fuels. does the radical left oppose it? You think it's just this map? See, you... For the, same, for, the just... same, for the same reason, the, the right opposes vaccines because it sounds scary and it's a big thing and they don't trust it. It comes well, from the right pharmacy. has a reason to distrust vaccines in the oh, aftermath of the COVID de debacle. <laughs> well, because think... they were imposed by force. And that was a very you, think you get to choose idea. if you have a nuclear... Are, are there any political government policies that are not imposed by force? They're pretty much all imposed by force. There's no, there's no other option, right? If capital gains rates are changed, if tax laws are changed, and you don't abide by those laws and you significantly violate them, you significantly increase the risk that you will be prosecuted and sent to prison. Like all government policies are imposed by force. At the end of the day, like someone with a gun will take you down and imprison you if you don't abide by government decisions, right? So it's not like vaccines or lockdowns or social distancing measures are somehow some weird exception to normal government policy, which is normally just voluntary, right? Virtually all government imposed laws are imposed by force. There's no other way to, to govern. The power plant, that's imposed by force too, no? You don't get to choose where your energy comes from. If you live in a country, you just, you turn the light switch and hopefully you don't have a Chernobyl that melts down in your particular town, right? Well, you get to choose it because you can buy it or not. 
Well, that's I mean, choice, it's not true. It does, but it, the Nobody negative... Had... You, you cannot choose where you buy your energy from. It's where you are on the grid. You get whatever the energy is coming from on the grid. I had a choice with the vaccine. Right, so understanding the things that you can change right, is incredibly important, right? Understand things you can change and the things that you can't change, right? Los Angeles in specific, uh, California in general, has a significant homeless problem that has grown significantly in the past uh, five years. If I devoted all of my life to this problem, I could only make a very minor dent in it. Right? This is a problem that goes beyond anything I can do. And so if I have delusions that uh, I have to sacrifice my own well-being to, to tackle this, this problem, right, I would not be living in reality. Right? We, we effectively don't get to choose the energy that we consume. Nobody had a choice whether or not they lived near Chernobyl or not. Nobody's a choice. Sure, they There's can, a nuclear they can move apartment. away. Well, how real well, is it to choice. move like 500 miles? That's like telling conservatives when uh, Biden tried to do okay, the OSHA well, mandate for vaccines, look, like, well, you can just get a different job, I'm right? Not, I don't want to yes. debate about whether or not large nuclear power plants are... Okay, yeah, Destiny, just that straight up. Saying someone can move away if they don't want to be next to a nuclear power plant is just like saying, well, you can just get a new job if there's a mandate. That's both a form of force, so to speak, because you don't have much choice in it. So I think Destiny made that point brilliantly. Okay, here's the most meme clipped moment of the debate that we'll talk about. The outcome was that Hitler shot himself through the head after he married his wife, who died from poison the same day, in a bunker underneath Berlin while Europe was in flames, while he was insisting that the Germans deserved exactly what they got because they weren't the noble people he thought they were. And then you might say, well, Hitler's plans collapsed in flames and wasn't that a catastrophe or you could say that was exactly what he was aiming for from the beginning because he was brutally resentful and miserable right from the time he was you know a rejected artist at the age of 16 and so he was working one of the interesting things about hitler is that he didn't grow up as a criminal right he didn't grow up doing all these awful things to people right if you looked at uh, hitler's life prior to him rising to power in the Nazi party, there was not a pattern of antisocial behavior, unlike with Joseph Stalin, who was a, a bank robber and had a, a longer and thicker pattern of antisocial behavior. So unlike most sociopathic murderers, uh, Hitler, prior to rising to power in the Nazi party, did not have a, a history of antisocial behavior or something was working within him and something that might well be regarded as demonic whose end goal was precisely what it attained which was the devastation of hundreds of millions of people and Europe left in a smoking ruin and the cover story was the Grand Third Reich and so there's no reason at all to assume that we're not in exactly the same situation right now. I think that's a great reason to assume. I think that Hitler's motives and everything that he was trying to do wasn't a secret. I, I, like, I don't think that anybody had to guess. That right, this idea that uh, we're living in a Hitler-like moment right now is absurd, but it's exciting. All right, if, if, you have, if you have a life that's been blessed by some of Jordan Peterson's teachings, and I would understand why tens of thousands of people could have received benefit from some of Jordan Peterson's teachings, from some of Dennis Prager's teachings. I mean, Dennis Prager had you know, some, some significant benefit on, on my life, but then you likely develop some sort of parasocial relationship with Jordan Peterson, with the Dennis Prager type figure, they, they become a father figure, and then you keep following them. And when you hear them say, you know, we're living in a time akin to the rise of the Third Reich, you're highly likely to take that seriously. And you, you may well think, well, this guy is wiser than I am, and he, he is seeing all sorts of things that I didn't see. So initially you became attracted to Jordan Peterson or Dennis Prager or some other guru because they were pointing out aspects of life that you didn't see. And now you're willing to perhaps give them the benefit of the doubt. It's like, oh, maybe they're seeing things I don't see. Maybe there is you know, another Auschwitz uh, being essentially built in, in Beverly Hills and I'm just not wise enough to see it, but uh, Jordan Peterson can see it. So why do people turn to those who aren't blessed by social convention because you become convinced that they can see things that uh, normal pundits, normal elites don't see. And so if you are going to maintain your status outside of polite society, you have to continually come up with things that uh, the normal conventional news media and 
academic elite are not pointing out, which makes you particularly predisposed towards conspiracy theories. So how do you keep coming up with cutting edge insights that are outside of polite society? Right? Very difficult to keep doing that. Uh, the, the pattern is to come up with conspiracy theories to meet your own need for for life-shattering, earth-shattering revelations. That he was incredibly anti-Semitic, that his secret, Aryan supremacy... Was That's a very, in my opinion, foolish point by Destiny. The idea that, well, he, what, what he wrote in his journals and about, and just publicly about, you know, Jews and whatnot, well, that reveals his true motivations. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not how the human mind works. We have a lot of unconscious, unknown reasons for what we do. And I think that statement by Destiny is actually indicative that he is driven by a lot of unconscious forces that he doesn't like to look at and understand why he's doing the things he's doing. Right. We can never fully understand what's driving us, but we can often get a significant understanding. And so if we don't have a clue why we want to help someone or want to hurt someone or want to confront someone, right? if we don't have a clue why we're engaged in some interpersonal or social battle, right, we're operating blind. And we're very likely to go off the rails and to act in ways that are not conducive to our own well-being. On the other hand, if we do have a sense of of what's driving us, then we will make better decisions. And when you're honest with yourself, right, you will be able to detect reality much more clearly. So if you've been listening to me for a while, you you can make your own judgments. If, If my trajectory is, as I think, an increasing level of clarity and understanding about what's driving me, I have become increasingly clear about what's driving other people. So if you're honest with yourself, you will detect when other people are lying or manipulating, right? You will detect when other people are pushing some, you know, bogus fraudulent agenda, and you'll be much better positioned to combat it, right? If something doesn't feel right, and if you recognize you have enough intelligence and enough honesty to give someone you know, a serious consideration and it still doesn't make sense, then you understand someone's lying to you or manipulating you whether they know it or not and you can better take measures to protect yourself. On the other hand, if you frequently lie to yourself, you're going to be much less able to detect when other people are lying to you. I talk about politics so much because I grew up in a household saturated by conflict and I was the mediator. So when I am looking at the left and the right and trying to be like, oh, but you're both right and both wrong, that's clearly an extension of what happened in childhood. And I don't know how much Destiny is willing to admit his childhood affects how he is today and the degree that the mistakes he makes are a consequence of him not recognizing that underlying motivation. This is all speculation, but my point is I think it's foolish to assume that we can judge someone's intent by what they say because a lot. Okay, so once again, why do people watch live streams? Because they tire of contrived discourse about, you know, all sorts of tropes regarding democracy and, say, civil rights and how the world operates that are clearly divorced from reality. I mean, the world overwhelmingly operates on the basis of hierarchy, and yet our rhetoric privileges democracy, even though very little of our life actually runs on democracy. A reality is that different people have different gifts. Japanese Americans, statistically speaking, empirically speaking, they seem to have different gifts than people of West African origins, as opposed to Ashkenazi Jews who seem to have different gifts from Sephardic Jews and Mizrahi Jews, right? Different groups have different gifts. Right? Aboriginals have a certain part of their brain, which is much larger than the same area for Europeans, which may account for why Aboriginals are so well suited for tracking. In, in a desolate uh, desert environment, so most of Australia is desert, and so Aboriginals are skilled with detecting the presence of water and other things about how to navigate this hostile terrain that people of East Asian ancestry and European ancestry simply don't have the same level of skills, right? Certain groups are dominated at instant improvisation, right? The, the, the groups that dominate the NBA and the NFL also dominate much of Uh, public discourse and rhetoric and stand-up comedy and performance and and politics because they are so skilled at fast improvisation. Then other groups, such as people from Northeast Asia, seem to be particularly skilled at family formation, uh, discipline, uh, plodding along with their education and making sacrifices for the the good of the family. And so you have a lot of uh, 
people from Northeast Asian ancestry who are particularly good in business, who are particularly good in the natural sciences. You find Ashkenazi Jews who are disproportionately successful in those areas of life that, uh, that uh, have a benefit from having a high verbal IQ, right? People from Northeast Asia tend to have a, a way above average visual spatial IQ. And so they have disproportionate success in the natural sciences and things like uh, engineering and, and medicine. Uh, Ashkenazi Jews have a way above average verbal IQ, and they tend to have disproportionate success in areas of life that reward a high verbal IQ. But with all these benefits, there always is some kind of downside. So Ashkenazi Jews, for example, are particularly susceptible to certain diseases, right? So with their certain genetic predispositions, right, it gives them advantages in some areas of life, makes them more adaptive to certain situations, but it comes at a cost of all sorts of diseases, that are much less present in other, you know, other groups. And Aboriginals are particularly adapted to surviving in much of Australia's you know, harsh desert terrain, but uh, not as well suited, for example, for thriving in a uh, intense urban environment like Sydney. When I was walking around Sydney, I saw, I think, maybe one Aboriginal, and he was walking drunk through a, a crowded street. Right? My only experience that I remember from childhood with Aboriginals was seeing them, you know, passed out drunk in the gutter uh, on streets. So the, the type of predispositions that suited them for navigating a challenging uh, desert terrain, not the same predispositions that uh, reward success in an increasingly abstract uh, urban culture that, uh, you know, rewards things like high IQ and the, the socially effective personality where you're high in conscientiousness. A lot of people don't know why they do the things they do. Uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change. The worry that I why have not? here is because why of not? Why not? People thought hit, people in Germany thought Hitler was perfectly motivated by the highest of benevolent. Uh, if benevolent I would, if aids. I would take this standard of first off, this is not a new point by Peterson. This is exactly what he said in the. Okay, so what kind of people supported Adolf Hitler? Overwhelming, there were people for whom he was aligned with their interests, right? M much of Germany resented disproportionate Jewish success. They resented the organization of international states that uh, had conspired against them, they felt like, after World War I. So those groups whose interests aligned with Hitler supported Hitler. Those groups whose interests were opposed to what Hitler and the Nazis were propounding, were not swayed by all the propaganda. Right? Virtually no minds were changed by the propaganda of Joseph Goebbels. Different groups have different interests, right? Some people in America today, they benefit from high amounts of immigration. So people in the upper classes, they benefit from getting cheaper nannies and gardeners and domestic servants, right? But people who are competing in the non-skilled labor arena, they substantially have not had a wage real income increase in 60 years because of the high amount of immigration. On the other hand, Australia significantly kept a limit on its immigration, particularly unskilled immigration. So Australia is the best place in the world for an average bloke. So some people benefit from high immigration levels and other people pay a price for that. Some groups benefit from free trade and then other people, such as those working in manufacturing and unskilled labor, uh, get hurt by it. So when you benefit from the policies propounded by a particular party, you're going to be much more likely to align with that party, whether it's the Nazis or the Republicans or the Democrats or the Social Democrats or the Christian Democrats or the Labour Party or the Tories. Kathy Newman interview. Under Mao, millions of people died. Right. I mean, there's no comparison between That's... Mao and a trans activist, is there? Why not? Because trans activists aren't killing millions of people. The philosophy that's guiding their utterances is the same philosophy. The point he's making, which is, I don't think. All right, that's absurd that uh, Hitler and trans activists or Chairman Mao are motivated by the same philosophy. The, the, the trans agenda is just part of the overall liberal agenda that, that we exist primarily to pursue our own happiness. And so if people who are, say, born biologically male feel happier, biologically female, what is there in liberalism that would deny them that opportunity? Right? Many people are unhappy. Many people are seeking solutions to their unhappiness. 
And it's always tempting to do the equivalent of a geographic, move to another place or move to another gender identity or move to another religion or move to another group or move to a different hairstyle, move to a different clothing style, move to a different uh, approach to life, right? Move to a different hobby, all right? We're all looking for easy solutions to our problems. That's why I often say our problems are not our problems. They're just symptoms of deeper problems, all right? I'm 57 years of age. I've never been married. But if, if I focus on that, that's just a symptom of a deeper problem that I have had of not connecting normally with other people. And then the lack of marriage is just a, a symptom of that. But that's not the real problem, right? To the extent that I've had problems connecting normally and building up community and friends in my life, that has primarily been just a symptom of my own ability to relate in a kind way to myself. I have not consistently been a good friend to myself over the course of my life. I have tended to veer between being punitive with myself. You're a stupid mother. Just, you know, my, my self-talk has just been vicious and cruel much of my life to incredibly indulgent. Well, you've had a tough day, 40. You deserve some high quality pornography. All right, so veering between a punitive relationship with myself to an indulgent relationship with myself, right, that has not been in my own best interest, and that then becomes reflected in my own inability to be a good friend to myself. That has made it more difficult for me to be a good friend to other people and has made it more difficult for me to sustain romantic relationships and to have a, a normal, normal life, and it comes down to, you know, at core, Am I interested? Am I capable of being a good friend to myself? And what was so amazing about going on ADHD medication is that all the tendencies that have, that have uh, made me a weirdo, all right, that the general weirdness that uh, people close to me and people far from me have perceived over the course of decades of my life, I, I feel like 90% of those tendencies just go away when I take my ADHD medication. And so Adderall and the stimulants, they deal with one part of ADHD, and that is the distractibility. All right, so when I'm working, I try to cover up any flashing lights around me because I'm just so easily distracted. But then there's the emotional instability, which is not really affected by the stimulants. So then there are other medications that affect that, such as clonidine and uh, stratera. And so they affect the... Rejection sensitive dysphoria, to which people such as myself and people with ADHD are particularly prone. We have more dramatic, more intense emotions. And when we feel like we're being rejected, we, we tend to spiral into the, the deepest depression. I, I remember I was working at a job where I was thriving. People loved me. I was doing great quality work. But then for two hours, I didn't get any email. And I thought, oh my God, my work email has been turned off. I'm about to get fired. But that wasn't true, right? That was just a story I told myself and my own rejection-sensitive dysphoria just kicked into gear from this false story that I told myself. And getting on something like clonidine and stratera helps with the emotional component of ADHD. I think anyone disagrees with is that every single human being is capable of extreme levels of malevolence. Everyone is capable of becoming a Nazi if put in the wrong circumstances. And I believe that. And so even though this seems kind of, well, that's kind of crazy, I think it's a perfectly valid psychological point and one that was uncontroversial, maybe not uncontroversial, but I, one that is not that controversial. Evidence and apply this lens of analysis. Couldn't I say the exact same thing about the conservative constellation of belief? They don't want to intervene anywhere in the world because they don't care about the problems there. Uh, they're anti-immigration because they hate brown people. Trump wanted Okay. Why do some people act in a heinous manner? It depends on the situation, right? When I am running late, <laughs> um, then I become not a nice person. To ban Muslims from coming to the United States because he's xenophobic. Uh, conservatives uh, don't want to have taxes to help the poor because they want homeless people to starve and, and die in the winter. Uh, but like, I feel like if I- Some if of that's true. And yes, you can ad adopt that criticism. I think the difference with regards especially to the libertarian side of the conservative enterprise, but also... Right, when there's a vital clash of interests, right, people will react in a particularly intense, hostile way, right? When I'm running late, I tend to operate in a reduced manner with regard to social niceties. Uh, my, my world just kind of shrinks down to, to getting to where I need to go and to doing what I need to do. 
and I get into the mindset, I've got too much to do and not enough time to do it in, right? I become a much more narrow, stiff, uh, mono-focused uh, person, right? I become much less pleasant to, to be around. Uh, when I realize that I've been operating in, in a delusion with regard to part of my life, you know, I, I completely lose my self-confidence, right? I usually only live stream when I have a considerable amount of self-confidence. You, you can see the, the live streams where I don't exhibit the self-confidence because then I'm just, uh, just quite, quite morose. And it's very easy on live streams to share all sorts of dark things that you would not share in normal face-to-face -face interaction. Stephen J. James, what's uh, new with you? Hi, Luke. How are you? I'm good, man. What's going on? Oh, not much. Not much. I heard you talking about climate change. I do have a really unique climate change conspiracy theory. I know you love a good conspiracy theory if you want to hear it. Beautiful, please. Okay, so oh, I'll put a link in the chat. The link is kind of important. It's about oil. Okay, it's in the main chat and I'll put it in the private chat. Um, maybe, you could, maybe you want to put it on the screen. I don't know, but look. Um, so this might be a bit out there. Cons my conspiracy theory is that about 20 years ago, people, some very intelligent people in the world figured out or they, they noticed that, look, oil is going to run out at some point. Um, and in, say, a thousand years, either way, nobody doubts that we are going to uh, not have gasoline cars, not have uh, not be burning coal. It's all going to be electric either way. But we don't have a thousand years of oil left. Or anything like that. We don't have a few hundred years. We have, I think, at the current current stage, it's something like fifty years, forty seven, something on that counter at current consumption rates. So we don't have enough time to get there. So, and even if we just like leave it to market forces as they stand, we won't actually like be able to work out the technology to get away from oil, get away from burning coal and everything in time before we hit this crisis point in about 50 years time. So we have to make it happen sooner. And how do we do that? We have to engineer a sense of urgency, a sense of crisis, because it's going to take trillions of dollars worth of investment and innovation and decades of innovation in R&D technology, in batteries, and in generators and, and all this kind of stuff and infrastructure to actually ever get us to the point where everybody has electric cars, like we're, we're totally away from burning coal and stuff like that. And the only way to do it is to create this crisis so that there is, um, that, that there's, uh, uh, we create an, an artificial market, let's say, uh, which is basically what's happened over the last 20 years. and. And so like with Tesla has, and electric cars now, our only way they are through subsidies and through regulation basically being enforced um, on people. So, so that's my, my wild conspiracy theory about why there is such an urgency. What do you think about that? I think a lot of that is true because the usually the, the most effective way to get significant change is to say there's a state of emergency. And so yeah, what, what yeah. you just said is not just true with regard to climate change. It's true with, with, with a very common political social tactic because when you can make the case that there's an emergency, then all the ordinary rules start to fall away, right? If we're in an emergency, uh, all the traditional rights that we have are, are vulnerable to being taken away. So during COVID, there was a state of emergency and so freedom of yes. movement, yeah. freedom of religion got, got taken away. If there's a climate change emergency, then habitual safeguards to legislation get uh, diminished or, or taken away. And there's a very common political saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. And it's not just something done on the left, but the, the Trump administration did it too with regard to immigration. They used COVID to effectively stop immigration, both legal and illegal, into the United States. So everyone tries to use circumstances to their advantage and claiming a state of emergency is frequently the most effective tactic. Yeah, so that's my wild conspiracy theory because, for instance, we could never allow ourselves to run out of oil 
no matter what. So we can never allow it to get that far because we need it for plastics and stuff like that. So there's like 47 years worth at current consumption left. And the thing is, nobody would be driving around in electric cars if it, uh, and they wouldn't be where they are if it wasn't for the sense of urgency and if it wasn't for subsidies that have got us this far already. And the truth is the battery technology already isn't that great. It still needs basically another like 50 years of innovation at normal market rates, but maybe it'll take like 20, 20 or 25 years with like all the urgency, all the regulation, all the subsidies, people thinking they have to make the change because we need batteries to be at the point where it's like filling up your car with gasoline at the moment where you go and you can plug it in and like in five minutes it, it's charged and the battery runs at least like twice as far as it does now at the minute it, you know we're still in like the early infancies so anyway i like a good conspiracy well also i think what you're reacting against and why you're you're attracted to live streams is the increased level of authenticity that you're reacting to the contrived nature of of news you're reacting to the contrived nature of public discourse there's so much of public discourse which just seems removed from reality. It, it's clear mm -hmm. that people are trying to manipulate us. And in reaction to that, I think that's what drives you, me, and a lot of other people towards things like live streams. What do you think? I do. I think also, like Elliot Black, I see through the bullshit, Luke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do, I do. I think I've started to see through it much more recently too. In, I, I did a video about this today in relation to people like Tucker Carlson. Oh my God, I saw him go on that Joe Rogan podcast and start with aliens. And I was like, "What are you doing, dude?" And I was, I'm so disappointed in these people, Luke. I, I mean. I used to look up to Tucker Carlson. I think I thought that me watching Tucker Carlson was giving me like a unique insight into the world. I was uh, I was seeing through the bullshit. Um, and now I, I look at him and I think, well, I, I'm, I'm just so disappointed. I'm just so disappointed that he just comes across as an utter grifter to me now. I don't know what happened. Well, I, I think I know what happened. What do you think of this theory? When you spot the contrived nature of public discourse, you move to a place that is out where the buses don't run no more. You, you stop being as dependent on social cues because you recognize that many of the things that are taken for granted in polite discourse are false. So you start suspecting yeah. that more and more of public discourse is false. So you move outside of polite society and then the the only people who tell it, who tell you that you're a brave truth teller and you're doing a great job are people on the fringe of society and you start becoming more and more vulnerable to audience capture and to maintain your position as a brave truth truth teller you have to keep giving people things that they can't get in normal discourse in the normal cycle of news or in normal commentary for elites so you become yep. irresistibly driven towards uh, conspiracy theories because it's the only way y you can keep giving your audience something new and exciting. Yeah, and then after a while you become enamored, in I guess too enamored with your uh, new brave truth tellers. Um, but then you start to, I know, get used to them and then you start to see through them um, and it just becomes, well, I don't know. <sighs> I started to see through so many different things. I even suspect it's like might be down to the fact that I, I you know, there's that meme that the prefrontal cortex only really develops around the age of 25, and that maybe it just kicked in for me, you know, a few years yeah. ago or something. I don't know what the answer is, but I've become super disappointed with all the people that I used to look, look up to. Um, Really, I'm only st sticking around with the Luke Ford show, basically, Luke. I've kind of um, given up on most of the other things from back in the day. Yeah, I think we've gone on a, a similar trajectory. I was pretty full of myself being a, a brave dissident truth teller between, say, 2014 up to 2020. But once mm. I broke from doing a daily show with Kevin Michael Grace, where... 
I was I was overwhelmed by his his brilliance and his charisma and his commanding personality. Uh, I mean, very you know smart, talented, talented man. And once I went out on my own and we we had the emergence of COVID, I I read yeah. a book on uh, the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, and how devastating it was. And I saw that an influenza epidemic could you know kill millions of people if we didn't uh, implement extraordinary emergency measures and it, it made sense to me that this new epidemic might very possibly be mm. as you know uh, as severe as the Spanish flu and so while uh, unfortunately I was not pushing or supporting the public health measures of social distancing I was not opposed to them either and so that immediately split me from almost all the the right wing talkers that I had previously felt simpatico with from yeah. Dennis Prager to Tucker Carlson. So for me, COVID was a key turning point in rejecting a lot of uh, partisan right wing discourse. W what were the key okay. turning points for you? I think for me, it was a little later and it was the Ukraine war. I remember this very specifically, right? Because in the, in the run up to, the Russia invading the Ukraine. I had, I basically swallowed the entire idea that Putin was on our side, that he was this, uh, this, this like trad guy that was fighting against, like, you know, the American Satan, the liberal uh, world order, and that he was something else, that he was the leader of this alternative. And somehow I bought this hook, line and sinker. Like many people still do to this day on the distant right, you see it. There's so much pro-Russian sentiment that's uh, off the charts. But in particular, what I'd done is I, I was, I did a few live streams. Barely anybody watched them back then. Barely anybody watched me still now. But even less back then. And I, I, I was listening to Vladimir Putin explain to everybody in the weeks leading up to it that he absolutely had no intention of invading anybody, and. Our leaders, do you remember that this time where our leaders, particularly Kamala Harris, flew over there and they were saying to us, Russia is about to invade. And I was absolutely certain that our leaders were lying to us because they lie to us all the time. So I did this live stream. Where I was watching Vladimir Putin's speech and saying how sensible he was, what an absolute statesman he was, how he was the sensible guy in the room. Our leaders are obviously lying, making it up saying it's not, you know, that, uh, that they're just, uh, that, I, I, what, I forget exactly, but basically then Russia invaded. Yeah, he, uh, Vladimir Putin had been saying that it was just a training exercise. And I, I swallowed this hook, line and sinker. And then after it, I realized, well, I was wrong about that. Our leaders actually were telling the truth in that instance. So what else have I been wrong about actually questioning them? And what about all these other people who had been drip feeding me this like slow uh, Russian propaganda over the years? All the people who like go on Russia Today, your, um, you know, all the various talking heads of the dissident right basically have a, a side gig. I've had a side gig on Russia Today or press TV, haven't they? And, and I realized, well, it's just like being slow drip, anti Western propaganda, some of it mixed with truth. But some of it not. So I had this real like period of cognitive dissonance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Colin Liddell, he seems to have stood up pretty well over the years. What do you think? Yes, that's why I have uh, <coughs> gravitated towards Colin Liddell a little. Um, I mean, he's, pardon my friend, she's fucking harsh on some of these. Yeah. Uh, on some of some of the dissonant, right? He's absolutely brutal. Um, and he he was probably uh, earlier than you and I in seeing through the bullshit of the dissonant, right? Even um, yeah. To, to some extent, that most people think he's like definitely some kind of MI five Mossad asset or something. Just, um, but I really do have. A feeling, you know, I appreciate where he's coming from, how he 
became so disillusioned with that scene so early on. Um, really, so you know, I guess so it comes to us all eventually. You've had, you've had. It sounds like a lot of uh, intellectual realizations recently. Are there other ones that you can share? Um, no, that's probably that's probably the best of, best of it, Luke. And I probably have to run. I probably uh, okay. Given my given my uh, given my best takes, I've noticed in the chat. I have a hater though, Luke here. Curious Gazelle. There's some. I think there's some sexual tension between Curious Gazelle and Ice because uh, she's being she's being mean to me. So you'll have to question her about that when she comes on next. Right, right. What, wait, wait, one more question. Uh, how have oh, yeah. you dealt with the temptation to overshare morbid thoughts? So people mm. who talk live and spontaneously, they tend to inevitably overshare morbid thoughts. How about you? Yeah, I've probably done that. I think I've gotten away with it a bit. Um, yeah, I did that a few weeks ago. Where I, I, I disappeared for a while and then I came back and I did a stream where I probably overshared um, a little. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, what about you? How, how are you managing with it? You share a lot less now, don't you? We know, we yes. know a lot less about your personal yes. life now than we used to do. I mean, we used to see you driving around, doing, doing videos at work and all kinds of stuff. You stopped all that, haven't you? Yes, I, I've become much more careful and conservative in my own age. I, I share less. I'm much less likely to stream when I'm feeling down. Uh, also, getting medicated has moderated many of my emotions. So I would, mm. I would share particularly morbid thoughts when I was in that rejection-sensitive dysphoria, when I was you know, cycling down into you know, a very dark place and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go down that place much less often these days. And if I'm ever approaching that place, I'm much less likely to share. So as my, as my real life gets better, my online life becomes more guarded because I've got more to share. Like when my real life is thriving, right? I, am, I, I feel much better about the status quo. When my real life is crap, I'm quite happy to you know, challenge the status quo. Yeah, you know, it's part of ADHD is the cyclical nature of moods, though. I think, Luke, have you ever have you kind Actually, of put the I, two, two together or not? I, I, or I, as I understand it, and I'm not an ADHD expert, I think that's actually the opposite. What what distinguishes ADHD from really? mood disorders is the situational aspect, incident aspect of ADHD. So, for example, bipolar and ADHD look very similar. But bipolar is cyclical mood swings, while ADHD is incident-provoked mood swings. So, for example, wh when I was at work and I didn't get any work email for two hours, that incident provoked me to spiral down. But then as soon as I started okay, getting yeah, work yeah, email I get again, you. I was you know, completely out of that dysphoria. Yeah. <clears throat> How about this, though? I, rather than mood, that might have been like the wrong descriptor. What I'm talking about is I go through cycles, periods where like, I, I, I have more symptoms than, than other times. And these periods seem to last maybe a month or certainly weeks, definitely days where I can't find anything. I can't do anything right. I'm clumsy. I knock everything over. I, I'm late. All, all these symptoms cluster together. And then I go through periods where I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sailing. I'm, I'm doing fine. I barely notice like the ADHD stuff, and then it comes back. Uh, did you, do, do you notice any of that? Yeah. So two thoughts. One is that this might be stuff outside of ADHD. So when you have these mood cycles that last for weeks, as I understand yeah. it, that's outside of ADHD. Second, mm. people with ADHD tend to be really poor at seeing themselves accurately. So okay. there, there may very well be certain incidents that are provoking the, this dysphoria and we're seeing it as a cyclical mood when really it may be uh, the loss of, of some, some part of our life that was making our life function and then we, we went down. So often we get borrowed functioning. So we form friendship with the community or with individuals who are much more functional than ourselves 
and we borrow their functioning and lift ourselves up. And this is what consistently happened to me. And I think, ah, now I'm finally living life right. Now I finally mastered life. I, I'm now an adult and I'm thriving. But what's really going on is that I'm, I'm just uh, borrowing functioning from the people around me and that never lasts long. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can see some of that. Um, yeah, I definitely go through long periods though. Where I just can't do anything right. Nothing, nothing works, nothing clicks. And then I get these periods where I'm in a flow state. Do you ever yeah. get that where you're in a oh, flow yeah. state? And, yeah. Yeah. And isn't it, isn't it great? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I wish oh. I could just ride that all the time, <laughs> dude. No, oh, that, that's so God. true. The problem with like one bad thing happening is it always seems to be accompanied by other humiliations. So they, they spiral. Yes. Like when there's a financial yeah. setback, there will often be social setbacks associated with it. And then things start to spiral downward. And uh, yeah, the, the, like bad news, humiliation setbacks never seem to occur singularly. Yeah, yeah. So, so how honestly is the medication then? How, how much... On a scale of percent-wise, like 5%, 10%, 50%, has it improved your life, do you really feel? I would say it's improved my, um, my work product uh, 40 50%. I would say it's wow. improved my life uh, somewhere okay. close to that 50%. So initially, I just went on the stimulant medication Adderall, which re yes. reduces my distractibility but it doesn't yeah. affect the emotional turmoil that, that goes with ADHD. So over the past few weeks, I've added clonidine and stratera, which affect the emotional, they're non-stimulant medications. They, they reduce the intensity of the emotions of ADHD, particularly the rejection-sensitive dysphoria. And I've now got some ADHD protection even when the Adderall isn't kicking in. So I've been able to reduce the Adderall like reduce the stimulant medication to just once a day, one 10 milligram tablet. And I've still got yeah. protection from these longer lasting non-stimulant medications. So they're, they're helping me on, on blunting the dysphoria to which I'm particularly prone w when I have setbacks. So I'm much more emotionally even and also less distractible. So I am really happy with, with uh, the, the medication. What are the others? Are the others uh, SSRIs or something like that? No, so I, I, they're, they're not SSRIs, so clonidine and stratera. So the medications that have been around a long time, I think clonidine initially started out primarily for use in lowering blood pressure. So it helps sleep. And I've been okay. on it in the past. I remember I went to a psychiatrist in something like 2001, 2002, and I said, oh, you know, I've got all these problems with narcissistic personality disorder and he says ah, i'm not so sure you know just take some clonidine it will it will take the edge off your emotional turbulence and it did and i was on clonidine for about uh, nine years and then i thought it'd be a good idea to go off it and then i became much more susceptible to the emotional uh, turbulence and then mm -hmm. stratera okay. again it seems to take the edge off the the uh, emotional dysphoria Interesting. And what about I? Um, you you titrated up to the higher dose, and you came back down. Is that correct? Yes. So I, I, I titrated up to the prescribed dose of Adderall right. that I received, which was two ten milligram tablets. Initially, I couldn't handle it because I was combining it with some caffeine. But right. if I don't take any caffeine, I found I could handle quite well the full full prescribed dose of Adderall which was two 10 milligram tablets, which is still mm. a relatively low level of, of Adderall. So I take yeah. uh, one tablet uh, about six or 7 a.m. and then the second tablet about uh, 11 a.m., 12, and I, I would sleep just fine as long as I didn't have any caffeine. Now I can have caffeine and one 10 milligram tab of Adderall. That doesn't seem to, to damage me. But then when we added in the Stratera and the Clonidine, uh, I found I, I function just fine with just one. You're able to reduce stimulants when you add other and non-stimulant ADHD medication. Yeah, don't you worry that you're taking <clears throat> taking too many drugs though. Now, I mean, it's, it's quite a combination. 
Well, if you use... Like, if even, it's doing you good, I suppose. Yeah, it, it, like, it's not like drugs are just some generic uh, challenge to your system that always produce no, a certain amount of side effects. Certain drugs have huge side effects and tremendous dangers. Other drugs have yeah. minimal side effects and minimal dangers. If you take stimulant medication as prescribed, there's very little harm in it. All right, you, you don't yeah. spiral into addiction. It keeps working for years and years and years. But if you abuse the medication, then there's harm. But uh, the drugs Stratera and Clonidine, again, they are the lowest level of, of medications, mm -hmm. right? You can buy these you know, online. God forbid that anyone do this, but people can buy these medications online from places like rxshop.md. God forbid that people do this because then they would not be sending money to pharmaceutical companies. Where, I mean, God forbid people go to RX yes. Shop MD and, and buy these drugs for like a dollar each instead of spending $20, $25 per, per pill at a pharmacy if they don't have medication. But the reason that uh, you can get drugs like this through sites like rxshop.md is that they're, they're at a very low level of uh, government uh, regulation. They're at the, the, the lowest yep. level. Yeah. So... So stimulant medication is pretty much at the highest level because it's particularly susceptible to abuse. But almost nobody abuses non-stimulants like Stratera and Clonidine. And so the drugs that I'm taking, there's just you know very little danger to them. Other drugs, there is danger. You take SSRIs, it shrinks the gray matter in your brain. Right? Yeah, there, yeah. There, are, there are good reasons to be highly skeptical mm. of many medications. Yeah, I think it's doubtful they even work to uh, <clears throat> much placebo effect in 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 the SSRI literature. From what I from my limited understanding, but who? What do I, I know? I agree. In I agree. But but the, yeah. the the placebo effect is is a wonderful thing. Like if taking a drug gives you the placebo yeah, effect, that's true. usually adaptive for most people as long as it lasts. Yes, definitely. You know what? <clears throat> you do know. Uh, obviously, I disavow this, but what you mustn't do, Luke, is inform your prescriber that you need to titrate back up to the 20 milligrams and then just stick on your same dose and start saving the other 10 milligrams for God a rainy forbid. day. God don't, forbid. Definitely don't do that. Definitely don't. Don't do that. Always do exactly no. what the people in authority yes. tell you to do because they know what's yeah. best better than you do. Yeah, and don't, don't buy... titrate up no, and no, don't save the extra pill no, for God, the days yeah. when you might have lost yours or, you know. Right, you might have like lost happen. your insurance. Like I pay $150 a month for my ADHD prescription and, and medication. And like, God forbid that I let that wane instead of sending $150 oh, a month yes. and just, you know, <laughs> operate for six months on all the stored up saved adderall and, and then you know re renew it again no, six months that later would be, that would be unsafe that, that would, would be unsafe that. or god forbid people buy this medication from overseas pharmacies that have a long track record of safety and efficacy and in expense and and don't follow the law and send the money to their local pharmacy like god forbid people buy this medication at five percent of the price overseas that they should be sending this money to pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, Big Pharma would go out of business, so we can't have that. This show is sponsored by Pfizer. Okay. Yeah, spiritually, if All not right. literally. Yeah. All right, on that note, I am going to go, Luke. Blessings. Thank you for having me on. Okay, right. take See care, Brian. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, uh, Charles Murray here tweets, an example of the young Tucker Carlson that has made me reluctant to go after today's Tucker. He was very impressive both in his journalism and his honesty. I ho keep hoping he'll change back. So here's an excerpt of the young Tucker. Young Tucker Carlson perfectly describing the new Tucker Carlson 20 years ago. I mean, ago. this is part of the sad thing of Happy Canada as far as I'm concerned. And just to restate, I mean, the, that does raise issues that I think um, are important. I mean, I think that, you know, the sovereignty of the American military, et cetera, I mean, these are not just crank issues. Um, but unfortunately, Pat Buchanan raises them in a way that I think is discredited. And when attacked, he can always fall back on the line, well, the, you know, the tiny cabal that controls American politics doesn't like me because I speak truth to power. This is actually, incidentally, almost verbatim what he said the other day, that I offend the plutocracy, um, that I'm a wanted man by the inside the beltway people, and, and, in, and in every sense cast himself 
as a, as a victim who is sort of a Karen Silkwood of politics, someone who's uh, so truthful that he's being hunted down by the, uh, by the conspiracy that runs Washington. I mean, it's, it's all a bit much. Maybe Pat Buchanan just says things that are kind of kooky, and that's why he's being criticized. It's perfectly valid to, to question America's relationship with Israel. Israel has a lobby. It's perfectly fair, as far as I'm concerned, to beat up on Israel's lobby. Um, but that's, I don't think that's the reason that Buchanan is being labeled an anti-Semite. It's this kind of, as I've said, this, this relentless um, this relentless bringing up topics related to uh, Judaism. I mean, famously, Pat, you know, always beats up on Goldman Sachs, but never Morgan Stanley. I mean, it's, it's really hard to, there is no point at which Pat Buchanan has held a press conference and said, you know, I really don't like the Jews. I think they're a sinister force in America. But I think, um, and it took me years to come to this, uh, to this position. I mean, I'm not throwing the, the term anti-Semite around. Um, but you, you reach a point when you say, well, gee, you know, here's a guy who uh, has gone out of his way to, to defend Dumyanyuk and other accused um, Nazi war criminals who's constantly attacked Israel, who's attacked uh, American Jews for supporting Israel unduly, who's implied that American Jews push America into wars in which non-Jews die. There really is, um, and again, I'm not hysterical on the subject, but I, I, I do believe uh, that there is a pattern um, with Pat Buchanan of needling the Jews. Is that anti-Semitic? Yeah. I mean, after a while you conclude it is in some sense anti-Semitic. I mean, Pat Buchanan obviously has a lot of personal and affectionate relationships with people who are Jewish. Um, so it, on a personal level, uh, perhaps he's not, but on a, on a different, maybe thematic level, I think he probably is. I think that people should be allowed to have differing views on immigration. I think people should be allowed to point out the fact that there is an Israeli lobby, and yes, it's powerful, and debate the merits of that, I, I guess. Um, I don't think there's, strictly speaking, anything wrong with that. But again, I think Pat Buchanan is part of the reason it's so hard to have that conversation, because he discredits it by his, by his presence, because he uh, gives people who watch him carefully the sense that he has another agenda that has to do with personal dislike and that he believes in conspiracies and, and that he believes that the Jews are this sinister, secretly organized force um, trying to affect American politics. And those aren't discussions I think normal people, uh, sober people should be having because I think they're ludicrous. Okay, so some some good points there, but is is there a tiny cabal that dominates politics? Yeah, in the sense that there are people who have disproportionate influence, foreign policy decided by a tiny group of people, and the broad will of the American public is not usually decisive when it comes to foreign policy. Almost all of life operates on the basis of hierarchy and is almost always operated and, and decided by a tiny group of people. Yet, at the same time, th this tiny group of people does not act, act in a vacuum. So circumstances, situations, and other forces will combat and overcome the decisions of the tiny group of people who normally decide things. So normally foreign policy is decided by a tiny group of people, but if there's enough popular discontent and it is wielded effectively enough, it can sometimes overcome the tiny group of people who usually run things. So you can look at different sectors of life from the National Football League to the Premier League to Wall Street training, trading and, I don't know, Homer studies and, uh, you know, different areas of, you know, elite life, and you'll find a tiny group of people who have disproportionate influence, and normally to get into that conversation and to make an effect in how this particular sphere of life operates, you have to learn to speak the code of the people who make the decisions. But the people who make the decisions don't always make the decisions. Sometimes you know, life is changed. Your boss isn't always the boss. You know who is always the boss? The situation's the boss. So sometimes the situation will make you the boss. Sometimes the situation will make the boss the boss. The boss will usually be more the boss than you will be the boss. But sometimes if the, the wheels come off at work, right, the situation becomes the boss. When the wheels come off in any area of life, right, conventional ways of deciding things may, may grind to a halt. So there are tiny groups of people who usually have disproportionate influence and disproportionate decision-making ability in all sorts of different spheres of life. But at the same time, you know, the wider situation will sometimes put a stop to the normal decision-making of a tiny group of people. 
right, we're used to thinking about in the United States as a democracy as opposed to a dictatorship such as the, the former Soviet Union. But much of U.S. decision-making is done by a tiny elite. Like, who decided on social you know, distancing measures? Who decided on suspending all sorts of rights that Americans took for granted, such as freedom of movement, freedom of worship, freedom of assembly? All right, a tiny group of public health officials lined up with leading scientists and politicians, and they took away many of Americans' rights. And so, too, with regard, we're going to war on behalf of Taiwan, if necessary, no matter if 80% of Americans are opposed. So yeah, there, there are, you can call them cabal if you want to make it sound sinister, but frequently a tiny group of people will have disproportionate influence. But nobody operates in a vacuum, right? No man is an island. No tiny cabal is an island. We're all joined to the whole. So the former Soviet Union, right, that's supposed to be this big, bad dictatorship, they removed Nikita Khrushchev from this position of tremendous power because they did not like the way he ran the Cuban Missile Crisis because they saw Khrushchev as being ineffective with regard to the Cuban Missile Crisis. They removed him from power. They didn't kill him, right? So in dictatorships, often the dictator has considerable less power than one might expect. You may resent your boss, but your boss operates under all sorts of constraints that you know nothing about. Like when I've been an employee, I just think primarily in terms of my own interests and what I want to do and what I think is right and wrong about when I clock in and clock out and use social media on the job and all sorts of things like that and how I want to speak to uh, coworkers and clients and superiors and managers and outside vendors, all right? But if I don't take into consideration what the boss wants, I'm not going to last long at that, that job. On the other hand, right, I have no idea of the constraints, the pressures, the, the considerations that my superiors and managers and bosses are under. Right? I know my own struggles. Right? I know my own temptations, say, to jump on social media during, during work time. But I don't know the financial constraints of my employers. I, I don't know their liability concerns. Right? The number one reason people get fired is because they come to be seen as a liability. And often we have no idea how our behavior, which we think is normal, natural, and healthy, and totally upright and righteous, is creating liability dangers for our employer or for our client or for our friends or for our community, right? Because we're just focused on what we need. And we don't tend to think much about what other people need. But if you're going to last long in any relationship, including with an employer or a client, a synagogue, a, a church, a stamp club, you have to think about what other people need. If you don't take into account what your boss needs, you won't last long at your job, right? You're very likely to become a liability and then you're very likely to be fired, right? On the other hand, if you think on a frequent basis, what is it that my manager wants? What is it that my boss wants? Right, you're much more likely to be aligned with reality. Your success at work, your income, right, your career trajectory depends upon how well you meet the needs of your boss. On the other hand, you can meet the needs of your boss, but if in the course of doing so, you don't meet the, meet the needs of the bosses of your boss, right, you're going to be out on your ass. So you don't have to just think about your boss. You also have to think about your boss's boss and the ultimate boss and the corporation and the community and the synagogue, the, the church, the stamp club, the life-saving club. You have to think about what the club needs. You have to think about what your spouse needs. You have to think about what your friends want. If you're not thinking about your, your friends' needs and your friends' priorities or your church's priorities, your pastor's priorities, you are very likely to go in a different direction from where the important people in your life are going. So if you're not taking into consideration the priorities of the important people in your life, you're going to diverge from them. And then the less and less in common that you have with your employer, your pastor, your synagogue, your rabbi, your friends, your, your spouse, right? the less and less you're in balance with the people who are most important to you, the more and more risk you are taking with those relationships and the more and more likely that those relationships will be ended. So you can be convinced you're absolutely doing the righteous thing and you're absolutely doing the right thing and the brave thing right? The halakhic thing, the, the Jewish thing, the Christian thing. But if you're not staying balanced and in alignment with the people who are most important to you, right, you're going to lose those relationships. 
right? You're not taking into consideration what your girlfriend wants. You're going to lose that relationship. You're not taking into consideration what your employer wants. You're going to lose that relationship. You're not taking into consideration what your rabbi wants and uh, other people at Shul want or your pastor wants or your particular club where you're volunteering, all right? You are going to lose those relationships. And the problem for, for dissidents, all right, who often start off correct in a certain area because all societies, right, you know, hold that certain obvious truths can't be said out loud, right? That, that's just the nature of humanity, that all groups have a hero system and all hero systems pretty much discount or deny certain elementary aspects of reality in the service of some other uh, theory, some other heroic part of their system whereby people get to feel like they're part of something that's eternal, something that's greater than themselves, that they are part of the inner circle of all inner circles, that they are the group who is most influential in the world, that they are you know, sending humanity on a trajectory that will save or redeem humanity from its sins, its flaws. Right? Every in-group has this perspective that they are the ultimate of all all in-groups, and in the process of constructing and living by a hero system, all, all communities put heavy sanctions on saying certain p obvious parts of reality that, that puncture that, that hero system. And if you don't take into account the effect of your words on your community's hero system, right, you are going to you know, lose touch with your community. So to some degree to the conservative enterprises, they're they're not building a central, gigantic organization to put forward this particular utopian claim. That's low-key kind of true. And so even if the conservatives are as morally addled as the leftists, and to some degree that might be true, they're not yeah. organized with the same gigantism in mind. And so they're not as dangerous at the moment. Now, they could well be, and they have been in the past, but at the moment, they're not. That's correct. JBP for the win. JBP smacks up destiny. Although here's where I think Jordan Peterson makes a very strange argument about force. How about if you're skeptical of anyone who's willing to use force to put their doctrine forward? Then, you, then you're skeptical of, of literally every single person, political ideology ever to ever have existed in, in all of humankind. Some degree of force, you would I'm undoubtedly believe this, right? Some degree of force is probably necessary for any kind of cohesive society, Yes. right? No, I don't believe that. Of course. All right, so no matter what decision you take, there are going to be considerable costs. Uh, I mean, the, me doing live streaming has, at, at a very minimum, cost me $50,000 a year in just uh, the time that I spent preparing and doing live streams uh, when compared to what I could do if I was just focused on making money. Of course there is. What? No, Even I if you had a tribe that. of 100, 120 people, if somebody was, uh, if somebody was stealing something, right, you have to punish that person. I that said earlier that... that 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 becomes complicated when you're dealing with the psychopathic types. Okay, but psychopaths make up one to three percent of any given population at any time. So that's why you would have to use force. Destiny's correct. And then Peterson goes, no, two contrarians, two titans, Benzos versus Adderall. And yeah, so Destiny discovered Adderall and it relieved him from his ADHD. It seems like so he no longer has to play video games while he's he's doing a live stream. Uh, should we take Jordan Peterson seriously? I, I think he's become increasingly unhinged, but we should recognize he's done some good work. And all sorts of people who are unhinged in one area can be profound and brave truth tellers in other areas. I mean, I don't want to think about the areas that I am unhinged, but to the extent that that's true, and it's certainly been true in the past, I've been unhinged in some things and, and brave and telling the truth in other areas. All right, everybody's flawed. Everybody hurts sometimes. So I think we need to make peace with the flawed nature of people. Uh, right now, if you push me to the wall and said, should we take Jordan seriously, yes or no, I'd say no, not, not right now, recognizing at the same time that he has done some valuable work in the past and will continue to do some valuable work in the future when people's level of unhinged commentary vastly exceeds their level of hinged commentary, then you reject them. So I would normally want a four to one ratio, right? I want a four to one ratio in my relationships of like four positive interactions to one negative interaction, right? I, I would, to me, that's like a minimum for a friendship or a relationship. And so too from public figures whose commentary I take seriously, I would want at least a, a four to one ratio of hinged commentary to unhinged commentary 
And right now, and I think Jordan Peterson meets that four to one ratio. And Jordan Peterson's just arguing to argue, it sounds like. Right. So that's a complication. Well, but I would say generally psycho- speaking but, okay, that the the necessity to use force is a sign of bad policy. And no, I don't think see, I'm not particularly Hobbesian. I don't think that the only reason people all Right, that's insane. All right. All government policy ultimately will boil down to the use of force. So destiny wins on that. Comport themselves with a certain degree of civility in civilized societies because they're terrified by the fact that the government has a monopoly on force that can be brought against them at any moment. I, think- I don't know. I'm kind of paternalistic in the sense that I think you can use force to influence behavior. Like if you make nicotine flavored vapes illegal, people will not hit the flavored vapes as often. And I'm Speaking from experience here. And a lot of conservative morality is essentially centered around force. And I guess social taboos are not force per se. But this is just a very strange argument from Peterson. I think that keeps the psychopaths in line to some degree. But I think that most people are enticed into a cooperative relationship. And that formulating the structures that make those relationships possible is a sign of good policy. I've got sure. to, I have to ask, because I have watched a lot of your stuff in the past. Um, I remember you speaking very distinctly on this, that for instance, when two men are communicating with each other, there is an underlying threat of force that kind of puts on the guardrails those particular social- Like the, like the threat of force going on between these two. Destiny could beat Jordan Peterson's old man ass, I bet. Interactions. For instance, yeah, I the could threat of the force is yeah. don't be psychopathic. What is it? How broader is psychopathic here? He's like the mobster, to, don't be psychopathic kid. We're defining. Well, I can define it. I mean, sure, yeah, so, go for it. Well, a psychopath... So I've spent very little time listening to Jordan Peterson. He's not someone that I've ever been particularly interested in. There, there are people that I read more accurately and other people that I'm just not interested in. And there's, there's a comment in, in the chat that uh, Richard Spencer hasn't been doing many Twitter spaces and that, uh, that I've been particularly sharp. All right, so a pity... Richard is not doing Twitter spaces since Luke Ford has a superior understanding of his sneaky ways. Yeah, I do think I have a pretty good read on Richard Spencer because th- this narcissist you know, recognizes narcissistic uh, attention-seeking, drama-seeking behavior in, in another you know, drama seeker like a Richard Spencer. So gain short-term advantage at the cost of long-term relationships. Right, so different people have different gifts, different grifts, and different flaws. And it's much easier for me to get a read on people who share many of my tendencies. Sure. Okay. I'll that's see. really the core issue. Well, you know, you... That's odd because I thought psychopath was a specific genetic thing where you're like amygdala is, small, amygdala is smaller. This is my point. Of course, force is an acceptable and necessary part of society. And even if it's just to deal with psychopaths, the fact that they exist is just a fact. So this is Peterson being goofy as hell. And then I believe he quotes like this whole book of Moses... And Moses, like, not using force when he should have or vice versa. And I'm like, that's just reading too much into it. I feel like you're just arguing to argue with Destiny at this point. Okay, unfortunately, because of YouTube TOS, I'm going to skip the part about the certain medical procedures. But I will say a couple things. First off, I want Destiny to be correct. I don't want all the people I know that got the the jab to have medical complications. And I believe that the overwhelming majority of people who got it will be fine. Are there some questionable things around it? Probably, but I do want to play this clip because I think it's hilarious. Consequence of that was that we injected billions of people with an experimental, and it wasn't a bloody vaccine. Of Just, course it no, was it wasn't. Yes, it it was. Was. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's what, not. Doesn't it have a 100% success rate? You think it's a definition of vaccine? The whole point of the vaccine is to give your body a protein it's to train on so the immune system works. Who cares if it's not the same? There's plenty of, there's they different types They used the word of... vaccine so that they didn't have to contend with the fact that it wasn't the same technology. There are different types of vaccines there certainly that are, are, that are different M- technologies. Fine. The mRNA vaccines is a type this of vaccine used to be technology. Vaccines. Now this is vaccines. No, it was like this and now it's like this. No, no, no. It was like this and now <laughs> it's like this. The MNR, mRNA technology was a radical qualitative leap for- Yeah, that's funny. It's like this. No, it's like this. No, it's like this. Just two grown ass men doing dick. Men. Yeah, I think uh, Destiny overwhelmingly gets the the best of that discussion. All right, uh, decoding the gurus on Destiny. So it's challenging for me to decode people like uh, Destiny because he is very smart. Right, he's very good at what he does. I, I would estimate that he and Jordan Peterson both have genius levels of IQ in, in the hundred and forties possibly above. 
two like audio podcasts are in a different category of things, but there's podcast drama as well. Right? The Daily Wire is currently having drama with Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro. So like this happens in Pundit World, but just as we'll see, the drama is like of a slightly different timbre whenever it's in streamer land. And one thing I'll also say, I've listened to an insane amount of content for this episode. Like I often listen to a lot of content for the people that we cover, but with Destiny, I've listened to a lot. Maybe you even went, by his, his you like went, some of you his... Went, you went above and beyond this time, Chris. I did. Um, this one. I did. Like it could have been over hundred hours of stuff that I've listened to, but in why would he listen to so much Destiny content? Because it's consistently compelling and entertaining. All right, uh, Destiny is ten times more entertaining and compelling compared to, say, the Red Scare podcast or Joe Rogan. Right, Joe Rogan's output obviously depends upon the the quality of his guests, but just talking about Joe Rogan as as an individual, right, not compelling. Joe Rogan as an operation is able to often bring on compelling guests. In any case, the outcome of that is one thing I'm very acutely aware of is that Destiny, you know, a bit like everyone, but in his case, perhaps more extreme than in others, he has different presentations depending on the venue that he's in and the audience that he's speaking to. And he's quite open about this. We'll see that he makes this. And that's a good thing. All right, all all the world's a stage and you should modify who you are depending on circumstance. You should not be the same person in church that you are at a bar or you are at a sporting event or you are at the gym. So to me, this is an indication of, uh, of health and maturity on the path of destiny. It's clear himself, but it means that if you took some of his content from like a mainstream interview, because he's increasingly being interviewed by Piers Morgan or appeared with Ben Shapiro or, you know, kind of high profile media or whatever, like the mainstream media. He's often on his best behavior. But I have a different demeanor when I go on Joseph Cotto and, and when I go on other shows. I am a different person somewhat depending on who I'm interacting with. There may very well be one comment in the chat that completely changes not just the the trajectory of this show, but changes the trajectory of my personality. All right, you affect me. Right, no man is an island. We're all we're all connected. I, I don't believe in this uh, kind of bubble identity of uh, enlightenment liberal left thinking that we can we can essentially abstract ourselves from the situation around us and just decide on our own uh, morality and, and meaning. Right, I think that what goes on next door affects me. The things that you say and, and the quality of your commentary has a profound effect on me. And he comes across extremely reasonable, doesn't use edgy terms or whatever, and kind of presents in a particular way. When he's on the... St- right, well, why do people like HBO? Because it gives a more profound depiction of reality compared to network TV, right? Network TV tends to be much more formulaic. Uh, HBO has m- more sex, more nudity, more, more swearing. Uh, it seems to have more of the stuff of, of real life and to be less formulaic. So too with live streaming, right? Much of contemporary discourse seems stilted and bogus and false. And so people turn to live streams for the authenticity, right? For the addressing of concerns that they have struggles and challenges that they have that don't seem to be addressed in normal media discourse for a community of of like-minded souls that people are less able to assemble in their real lives. So they have to go online to find people who share similar concerns and struggles that they do. And then becoming part of a team or a community and struggling with the teams and communities from from other live streamers so there is often spectacle and drama and information that is often presented in a less stilted way than you get in otherwise the, the more you know the more conventional and polite forms of, of news and discourse all right you, you get a more direct less mediated less stilted type of conversation on live streams than you do when it comes to 
what corporations give you. All right, back to decoding the gurus on Destiny. Dream, again, it's different. And it depends who he's talking to. You know, if he's talking friendly with someone, he'll be different if he's interacting with the stream. If he is debating on, you know, like a panel with Alex Jones or with uh, red-pilled people, yeah, it, it's, all, it's different as well. So the reason I mention this is that the content that we select could give quite different perspectives. Like if we only took some of his recent interviews from mainstream media, and we are going to cover a bunch of the stuff there, you would get a different perspective than if we covered his streaming content with like a red pill, Nick Fuentes character, or, you know, some drama stream about him debating with various orbiters. So that means that in order to properly contextualize them it feels that we need to cover a broad spectrum of stuff so on the show we are often focusing like on a single piece of content or so not just every event needs its proper context but every individual needs a proper context all right i'm not a scientist i'm not the type of person you want checking the engines before the plane takes off all right i am a blogger and a vlogger with the strengths and weaknesses of that medium uh, Rob Eshman, the former editor of the Jewish Journal of Los Angeles, said, I was born to blog. I, I was not born to do brain surgery. All right, so one should not judge Ben Shapiro on a comparison of, by the standards of, say, you know, academic history. All right, Ben Shapiro is a provocateur and a pundit who is successful to the extent that he meets his particular community's needs of generally saying the most right-wing things possible and still remain within the Overton window. So you don't judge a pundit by the, the standards of academia. You shouldn't judge a live streamer by the standards of mainstream journalism, right? Every individual has to be understood in his particular genre, right? Uh, accountants have certain tendencies. Lawyers have certain tendencies, all right? Lawyers tend to be highly concerned about liability, right? Stephen Miller and his America First organization primarily went after law groups, law firms, with a series of lawsuits to challenge them on their various diversity initiatives. Why did Stephen Miller's group choose law firms to go after? Because law firms tend to be the most liability concerned, right? Most conservative with regard to risk of any type of business. So by creating incentives for law firms to dial back on their diversity initiatives, uh, Stephen Miller's group was able to send a, a current through American business discouraging diversity initiatives because they, they deliberately focused first on law firms because law firms are the most liability averse of any major type of, of business. So dentists have their own predilections. You know, rabbis have their own predilections. So someone who has had, you know, six years of rabbinic training and then worked in the field for 20 years will develop mannerisms that are different from someone who spent his life in landscaping. I spent a few years in landscaping, and now whenever I look at a garden, I start looking at drainage. Right? How is this going to drain when water and rain hit? I, I would not look at gardens that way if I hadn't spent that time in landscaping. I spent a number of years in journalism, and I think about events in terms of who, what, when, where, why. And I'm very good at that. Other people who developed a legal training, right, they will think about life in completely different terms than they thought about life prior to law. The more successful someone becomes in a profession, whether it's dentistry, medicine, professor, rabbi, attorney, uh, businessman, all right, the more they will think in terms of what has proven so successful, what has fed them and their family, provided them status, prestige, and meaning, all right, that's going to reinforce the tendencies of who, that have brought you the whatever amount of success you've achieved, right? We all want to do things that we're good at and minimize doing things that are uncomfortable, unpleasant, painful for us, things where we're inept. We want to thrive. Or two pieces of content. And that is what we are doing today. We're taking a piece of content which was focused more towards the streaming audience and then a piece of content which was focused towards like a more mainstream audience. But I also have a, a bunch of other clips which will provide contextual 
information. And I think it's important to go through them because it like any single one I think could give like a misleading presentation on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely is multifaceted, produced a huge amount of content. So it presents a bit of a challenge for our usual methodology. So yeah, yeah I mean, this will work, but uh, yeah, just to remind people that what we try not to do is to go digging and cherry picking and finding like the, the worst things. That- yeah. Nobody wants a poorly designed septic tank, right? If you need a septic tank installed, don't call me. Someone has said, and just, just relying on that. And likewise, going in the other direction, just finding good stuff. In general, with someone like Jordan Peterson, say, or Eric Weinstein, you can pick a random piece of content and it will be pretty representative of who they are. I think this could be somewhat true of Destiny, but like you said, he's a multifaceted character. He's been doing this for a long time, producing. So I want to get Art Bell to LA because I've been talking to Art Bell for, for years and we just seem very much on, on the same page. But uh, I had a therapist who made a very sharp observation that I don't like to negotiate relationships, right? <laughs> And I've had friends who say, you know, I'm, I very much want things on my own terms. Like when I get bored at a dinner party, I just leave. I, I don't stick around for awkward social interactions. I don't like negotiating. It probably has to do with, with my tendencies towards an anxious attachment style. So I pretty much, you know, narrow down my life doing the things where I can largely control the parameters or I'm comfortable accepting certain parameters. So. I'm not, I'm not someone who tends to host a lot of people. I'm not someone who just, you know, opens myself up as uh, Mr. Hospitality because I, I really like my, my friendship interactions and my social interactions on certain stiff terms. So it's probably my reaction to all the instability in my early childhood when my, my mother was dying. And so I was living in different homes at different caretakers. And then my, my family moved a lot. And so probably in reaction to that insecurity and that anxiety and that, that you know, unstable atmosphere, I have reacted by being particularly uh, stiff and inflexible with the terms that I interact with other people to my own detriment. And I remember I had a therapist said, maybe you'll only get well if you put down your guns. So I remember it was very painful to me when I was converting to Judaism and people would sense how insecure I was and they would kind of drill on it. Like when you, when you display weaknesses, it makes it irresistible for people to kind of push on those weak points. And kind of I resented uh, the power that uh, I felt like rabbis had over me. And then when I developed a blog and I was able to take down various rabbis who engaged in heinous behavior, you know, I felt much more defended because if someone was abusive to me or my friends, right, I could investigate them and if appropriate, take them down for horrible and illegal behavior. But uh, then a therapist re- reacted to me saying that by, well, maybe you'll only get well if you put down, put down your guns. Untold hours of content and the content is very different depending on the context. So we're going to, yeah, try to be fair about it. Yeah, but like with Hassan Pecker, there's a couple of clips which are infamous and that are part of the reason that, you know, there's controversy or whatever. And and the most recent one, I'll just play here. This is Destiny talking about Gaza. And this is from before the October 7th attacks. So this is on the, one of the, you know, stream things and people are playing games or, or Destiny at least is playing a game or somebody is. I don't know. Anyway, listen to this. Um, honestly, uh, I'm pro genocide. Like, it's not, it sounds really shitty, but like, I think that Israel should just drop its fucking borders about where it's, it is now, and basically, <laughs> Palestinians can go live in another place. That's, that's really shitty, but like, that's about where I'm at. I don't know you just think the Palestinians should just pack up and Native American the fuck out of there? The problem is that it seems like there is a hugely general hostility to Jewish people across really the entire yeah. world, but definitely the Middle East. So the problem is that as you weaken Israel's like ability for Jewish people to live there, it seems like there is a because there's a lot of different organizations across the Middle East that are highly invested in the destruction of Israel. 
So that's yeah. like a really rough thing too. So it seems like if Israel is forced to make concessions to Palestinians, it threatens Jewish people's ability to have a homeland. And okay. if yeah. So I don't know. It's really sure. There, truthfully, the answer is like there's no good answer. Um, it's hard. Um, yeah, it's it's hard. It's a really really complicated situation. Okay. Well, because sure it seems like it seems like appeasing either end basically means like kind of the destruction of the other end. If you give yeah. the Jewish people what they want, Palestinians are essentially permanently cocked out of what they feel is their rightful homeland. And if yeah. you give Palestinians what they want, then probably a lot of Jewish people are going to die. Right now. Mm. So that has to be understood in, in the context that uh, he, he was joking, he was talking in, in a uh, bro ki- kind of way that uh, he was using rhetorical overstatement. He was making you know, a harsh joke and, and he's reacting to what, what uh, supporters of Israel would see as excessive talk about Israel d- deliberately committing genocide in Gaza. So from a pro-Israel perspective, Israel could wipe Gaza off the map, and it's stunning how few civilian casualties there have been considering the difficult circumstance in which Israel is fighting Hamas. And so from from my pro-Israel perspective, all right, if if it's true that uh, there are approximately 12,000 dead Hamas militants, that means that Israel has killed fewer than two civilians for every dead militant. And that just shows the extraordinary lengths to which Israel has gone in this urban warfare because the normal ratio of dead civilians to dead militants in this type of urban warfare is supposedly nine to one. And so if this is true, then Israel is you know, bending over backwards to reduce civilian casualties. And so with that perspective, you will react against all the, the Israel committing genocide talk and Destiny's comment needs to be understood in that context. So... He, he begins by saying something that on the face of it just sounds absolutely heinous. But then as he moved away from just joking and talking in the vernacular, he gave a much more sophisticated analysis. Hmm. So, you know, saying that you're pro-genocide, never a good look, never a good look. And people have focused on this clip because Destiny has since gone on. Right. But, but words should not be treated as magic. Comments should not be treated as magic that uh, if you just, use a certain incantation, a certain alignment of words, therefore it always means something, right? Words need to be understood in their context, right? Knowledge and books need to be understood in, in their context, all right? When you're trying to analyze a literary work, you need to know who likely wrote this, when was it written, and for whom was it written? So knowing the likely authors, knowing the intended audience, knowing the context of a piece of writing enables you to understand what's really going on. And so too with just a comment on a live stream while a guy's playing video games. You have to understand the context of what's going on. You just can't understand everything literally. You don't read a love letter the same way you read an electricity bill, right? You don't relate to comedy the same way that you relate to sober political commentary. Now, one way that uh, humor is particularly effective is that even the simplest jokes require so much cognitive processing that uh, people don't tend to take offense at uh, those who make jokes, right? If, if something is funny, that tends to use all the cognitive processing power in people's mind, and it leaves them with considerably reduced cognitive processing power to estimate and analyze the, the content of the joke, the political or social or cultural or religious point being made by the joke. Your, your energy gets taken up by understanding the joke, then you have less cognitive power to process whatever argument is being made in the joke. So making an argument through humor tends to be very effective because you tend to bypass people's critical faculties. And to become quite active in debating and discussing the conflict in Gaza. But to me, this clip illustrates the tendency towards edgy comments because the subsequent discussion like is relatively not so extreme right he's just saying that these are two incompatible solutions and there would be issues but it doesn't undo that you just said like i'm pro-genocide that's the reason that this clip got kind of shared around everyone Mm -hmm. and a lot of destiny fans were saying well this is out of context but the point is find me the clip of you or I or various other people saying we're pro-genocide, right? Mm. You won't find that because, yeah, well, we're not going to say part of, it's, it's, shit. 
Yeah, it's part of the issue though, Chris, that... Okay, painful comment in the chat that uh, Batya, Batya Unga Sargon is in the debate with Dennis Prager, moisture-faced lady, a youngish Luke. Well, I once made a critical comment about Batya Unga Sargon when she was the opinion editor of The Forward, and we proceeded to have a lovely DM conversation about chronic fatigue syndrome and other personal issues. It was a beautiful conversation. And then I make it a second critical comment, and then she blocked me. So despite, despite our lovely one-on-one -on -one DM conversation, I am blocked from Batya Anga Sargon's Twitter feed. And because perhaps it, it's me, perhaps I was too hasty. Perhaps I was too harsh. Perhaps I, I went too far. Perhaps my, my criticism was not uh, well, well calibrated. But uh, once again, you know, it cost me what, what might have been a, a beautiful friendship. It's very tempting when you're doing live streams to just affiliate with your tribe and to put a whole bunch of people off limits from criticism. So this comes at the cost of your intellectual integrity and costs at comes at a significant cost to the intellectual quality of your stream, but it's a much more harmonious approach for your own well-being, right? You just decide that you've got a tribe, you keep key members of that tribe off limits, it uh, enables you to you know, get along with other people, have a more harmonious life, and uh, even thrive because you will essentially join forces with you know, other members of your tribe, and it can boost your online career, but you do it at the cost of of not making necessary criticisms. Like we don't record 12 hours a day, day in, day out, free associating. Like for instance, I, I watched a different content from you, from Destiny, just, just random Destiny content. One, one thing I watched recently was um, him interviewing an, another influencer type guy. Um, he's, his name's Ryan Macbeth. He's okay. He's kind of like a mid-tier like military guy comments on military things and he actually gets a bit drunk during that interview and doesn't acquit himself that well i've seen other stuff from him where he's better but in that interview destiny he, he basically does the he, he's like an nbc anchor basically he's asking reasonably good questions you don't hear anything controversial in the hours that he talks to this guy so yeah i don't know well, yeah, and I'll just highlight a clip which is kind of contradicting of the image that he's purely an apologist for the IDF. So the, recently there was an attack where the IDF blew up some aid convoy. I can't remember the organization exactly, but, it, but anyway, it was a humanitarian convoy yeah. and it was targeted by the IDF, right? And the IDF gave an explanation for it and, and Destiny has been very strong. So Dem, uh, Dennis Dale, apparently living in Orange County, we, we streamed together for, for years. Unfortunately, so many of uh, us you know, fall out uh, over time, and it's a, it's a damn shame. You know, I'd love to meet up with, with Dennis Dale. I'd love to be able to revive that, that uh, acquaintanceship, possibly friendship. But uh, unfortunately, I've been unable to maintain a community of people who come on the show because we have profound differences often and we you know, have passionate disagreements and we start criticizing each other's ideas and each other and it can be dispiriting because you may have you know worked so long together and then to get you know an unexpected or overly harsh criticism it uh, throws throws people off and yeah i think it's a damn shame that uh, i can't keep uh, dennis dale and kevin michael grace on my show and uh, you know, maintain those those friendships strongly pro-Israel throughout the conflict, but he, he covered the statement and here's a clip of him talking about that. That idea of like, oh, it's a chaotic environment com coming from F-16s or whatever, or whatever the planes they fly to bomb. This was not like a key, to, like the hostage situation where the three hostages were shot. That was a chaotic moment. And I can, I, I'm way more sympathetic towards that in that moment. For this targeted airstrike, for uh, people that you had intel on ahead of time, on a pre-approved humanitarian aid route, shooting convoy vehicles, no, that excuse doesn't work there. That doesn't cut it. Do you think a Hamas member, do you think that they thought a Hamas member was on board? Again, even if a Hamas member was on board, 
That can't be the calculation. We're gonna go ahead and blow up three humanitarian aid vehicles with, with six, I need to get the number right, six or nine foreign nationals on it because a Hamas member is on board. That can't be the calculation. That's, it's too much. Even if there were, even if there was a Hamas member on board, the entire world, and, and probably even Israel, is not accepting that, like the population, won't accept that proportionality. That's unhinged. You can't, that can't, you can't do that. Unless it's literally like King Hamas himself. You can't, there's no way you can do that. That's insane. And uh, commentary that uh, Destiny is a shock jock. Don't the decoders understand that? I think they do understand it. He's a, but Destiny isn't just a shock jock. Right? Destiny has feelings. He isn't just a shapely pair of shocking jocking. Right? He is also capable of sophisticated and nuanced discussion. So sometimes he operates as a shock jock. But that's not all he is. He's much more than a shock jock. Right? That, that guy down at the park who's, who's you know, flashing his pee-pee at children. He's not just a flasher, all right? That guy who sucked one penis, all right? He's not just a cocksucker. He might also be an architect, right? He might be a preacher, right? He might be someone who helps the homeless, all right? We are not just, you know, our worst parts, or we're not just the most attention-grabbing parts of our lives, all right? I'm not just the porn guy, all right? Uh, yeah, I wrote about the porn industry for 10 years, but I contain multitudes, I have hidden depths, right? Destiny has hidden depths, right? The flasher has hidden depths, right? The, the cocksucker has hidden depths. Yeah, so there he's sounding, if you didn't know anything about Destiny, then you could well assume that the person speaking there was very much a critic of Israel, perhaps even pro-Palestinian. And comments in the chat, uh, Dennis has been in Orange County for a while, but he hasn't streamed lately due to personal emergencies. Well, it's usually a good thing when you're going through emergencies that you don't live stream because we all tend to be profoundly affected by whatever's going on with us. If I'm in the middle of a personal emergency, it will be very hard for me to, to accurately see the world around us because we don't tend to see the world around us as it is. We tend to see the world around us as we are. We all have highly effective filters that just block off a lot of stimuli from penetrating to our, our conscious thinking, right? If you have a friend and your friend says something horrible or acts badly, you will likely find ways of excusing that friend. You may be shocked to learn that I've often said, you know, horrible, horribly inappropriate things, and my friends excuse it, right? They understand it. They find justifications for it that uh, normal people who may be in a disinterested perspective, they will just rightly say, oh, what you just said was horrible. How you just acted was plainly horrible. But people who love me will try to justify and, uh, and understand and make excuses for you know, anything horrible that I've said and done. That's how we operate with our friends. All right? We see our friends through a particular filter. We usually only know our friends through one particular segment of life. And then... We take, you know, that, that one narrow experience that we have with people and we use that to understand everything they say and do. But people are frequently very different in how they operate at work, to how they operate with their spouse, to how, how they operate with friends, how they operate in synagogue, how they operate in business, right? The situation tends to have a tremendous effect on us. But if we like people, we'll just come up with excuses. If you like Donald Trump, you just come up with excuses or explanations that uh, show that the seemingly horrible things he's saying and doing really aren't that horrible. If you think Donald Trump is a mortal threat to the country, then you'll come up with excuses for all the people who are politically opposed to him. So let's, uh, let's bring Duvid back to the show. Duvid, long time, no talk. What's, what's going on with you? Hey, Brogashem. Happy Passover, Chag Sameach. Yeah. What, what's new, man? Uh, nothing much. Nothing much. It's been like two months. There, there, there must be what, what uh, what's say what's going on with your your Jewish communal life. Are you participating in the wider Jewish community, or are you primarily doing your own thing? Yeah, I get mostly my own thing. I haven't participated much. Like I, I went to the kosher store to buy stuff for Passover. I got my oven on self clean right now. I was about to do uh, some cleaning, but uh, yeah, not much communal stuff. Besides the chess coaching. What happened to that guy that you brought on my show? He's, he was a convert to Judaism for, for conservative 
Judaism seemed an interesting young man. I think you guys did some streams together. Yeah, and no, I think he's stuck with it. I, I haven't really seen him for a few months, and I, I think he messaged me and actually said he's finally going to Israel, although it's possible that, you know, with the war situation there that, that it, he might not be able to get there, but he messaged me that uh, he's uh, you know, going to be in Israel uh, tomorrow, but I'm not sure if he came through with that. Like, like, I, wow. I only saw him once or twice after. We, we did, like, uh, the whole prayer book, uh, regularly we streamed it and uh then really saw, saw each other like once or twice he was a whole hour away and uh you know there's one like conservative synagogue near his house that he got more involved with he messaged to say finally uh you lane right from the Torah. he's been studying hard for that so it looks like he's still on his journey if he gets to israel it'll be interesting to see what happens you know i could ask him if he wants to come back on your show otherwise it'll probably be hard for him to integrate, although he might have some Jewish identity, you know, just in his area and, uh, you know, which would be different than, uh, you know, like a mainstream conversion or, you know, being closer to an actual Jewish community. Now, I, I just mentioned on my show that I had various therapists who, who pointed out that I tend to be quite inflexible in my relations with other people. I very much want to have interactions on my own terms and you know, following you know, certain circumstances and situations in which I, I'm comfortable. I'm not like Mr. Hospitality. Uh, how, how comfortable and capable are you at having interactions with, with people that are not on your own terms and just fitting in with what other people want to do? Um, as I've gotten older, I'm not really part of that many interactions. I, I guess I, you know, I'm capable of, uh, you know, for the purpose. So like, you know, generally just uh, live and let live. If it's the interaction is the purpose for, you know, avoid conflict or, you know, like example at the chess club, you know, where I just do what I got to do. I, I do my business, uh, work together with uh, what we have in common and you, know, then we go our separate ways. So that, that's probably always been my strategy you know, if you're developing more closer personal relations, it might, uh, you know, take a different strategy, but just for like public, uh, business interactions, uh, you know, never that much difficulty, just, you know, what's the pertinent business deal with that. And then, uh, you know, hold my tongue, avoid, uh, you know, anything that could cause uh, issue. Now I heard an observation that, uh, it was after commenting on, on a book by a rabbi who didn't have children. And I don't remember the name of the rabbi, but the, the book uh, seems to portray, you know, a rabbi who is, is seeking uh, fascination and excitement of, of a healthy type, not, not of an unhealthy type. And I thought it was incredibly wise, uh, Mark Shapiro's commentary, that people who don't have children are often, men in particular who don't have children are often craving something exciting, something compelling, something that, that uh, fully absorbs them. Uh, I, I believe that you don't have children. I don't have children. How, how accurate do you think that observation is? It might have some accuracy, but no, I would say I'm pretty conservative. I don't uh, you know, really look to do anything exciting. Um, and you may be like Michael like that, where, you know, like the organized Jewish community is definitely child family centric. Although, you know, to, I enjoy being, you know, like I, I look in the mirror, I see myself as a Jew. I interact with people as a, a Jew. I mean, the situation with the war in Israel is definitely making it more difficult, but, uh, you know, so you could, there could be layers of the community where I just enjoy being Jewish, talking about Judaism, interacting with mostly non-Jews, as a Jew, oh, and then avoiding the discussion of the larger Jewish community, or I mean, not necessarily avoiding it, but uh, you know, being separate from the organized Jewry. So I mean, you might you might play both ends, and if it's kind of like Michael, you know, he just enjoys chanting Hebrew, uh, studying, going to synagogue, doing the prayers, uh, without any you know, real connection to organized Jewry or a larger community. So, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of, uh, you've gotten used to that and, uh, 
em embraced that. So I haven't shied away from, uh, but you know, definitely within the organized Jewish community, it's uh, you know, much different. And you know, it'd be the central question of you know, children, what's wrong with you? Uh, you know, and uh, you, you have someone like outsider role. But uh, do you identify with the need for excitement, something to absolutely absorb you in the absence of fatherhood? Uh, no, no, I'm just, you know, I'm, mostly my intellectual activities keep up my time. Like I research, doing a little writing, blogging, streaming, talking about intellectual things that you know, basically satisfies uh, my hunger and uh, most of my spare time. So, you know, like, I, I don't even think, uh, I, mean, I could see, like, you know, definitely, uh, uh, you know, the freedom to uh, take more risk. You know, maybe like you know, travel, do more, uh, but I don't seem to uh, you know take any of that opportunity. It's not and doesn't particularly interest me. And I could see you know, think as long as I have my my health, my mental health, that that's unlikely to change. Like I don't think I'm likely to become. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been pretty risk adverse my whole life. That uh, I, I doubt I'd start doing uh, risky things. But isn't your intellectual pursuits and your your live streaming? Isn't that exciting to you? Uh, are these healthy forms of excitement that you seek? Yeah, it could be. And you say my intellectual pursuits are risky in, in a way that if I you know, had family and children at Jewish schools, it might, uh, you know, even to, the pushback might be too great. I had that big debate with, uh, you know, this uh, Muslim guy, Daniel uh, Hikwaka Chu, uh, who actually had like a hit piece on the ADL the day that I debated on modern day debate. And, you know, I don't, I mean, I got a little feedback from, uh, you know, it was a big stream uh, over collectively, maybe even over a hundred thousand people watched, uh, watched it, but uh, you know, almost no interaction from anyone I knew and in, in like in the Jewish community, almost certainly would have been uh, negative. So if you say like that might be more high risk activity, even though it's relatively intellectual, now, was it uh, Joseph Cohen who you did a live stream with about a year ago and he, he had some criticisms of you? Was it Joseph Cohen, the British guy? Yeah, and that was uh, from Adam Green. And you know, so I, I guess like if I'm just an independent Jewish scholar, so I, like I've, I've done the research now to kind of fully understand this difference between organized Jewry and unorganized Jewry. And then even like kind of like, you know, I don't know if you were talking about talked about the Nathan Kaufman's downfall, but kind of this like, well, if you're not part of organized Jewry, you're not part of organized Jewry. And if you are part of organized Jewry, then that somewhat means respecting their hierarchies. So, you know, that term like, you know, like you're not a spokesman for Jewry or, or even Hasidic Jewry, which I had somewhat to an extent done community relations for the Hasidic community. But, you know, so I still talk to people be a Jewish scholar, but then it's just completely more based on like this is what the book says this was my experience than uh, you know even attempting to put myself forward as some sort of representative of the community uh to the extent you feel comfortable are you willing to share on your experiences if any with psychiatric medication um no, i have none i mean just the marijuana in fact i was almost thinking you know, like god forbid that now there's like multiple recreational marijuana places like literally like within half a mile of my house a mile of my house so i was briefly thinking of picking up a, a joint or two for passover but i didn't do it yet but uh no i don't have any experience with any uh, medicated psychiatric i don't know about you if you see kind of that uh you know like we talked about that in the past where, where you could just be enjoy being jewish enjoy interacting with people as a jew talking about the various aspects of Judaism you like. And then there's also the aspect about the community, um, you know, being a representative of larger Judaism, which, uh, you know, I've, I've learned to separate. And uh, you know, maybe you have uh, both both ends of that, because I, mean, I think you probably had large points of your life where you were largely interacting with people who didn't have that much interaction with Jews. And you might have just enjoyed, like, yeah, I'm a Jew and talking about Jewish things versus like a representative of the Jewish community. Well, I, I, there's, there's never been a time in, in the last uh, about 30 years where I haven't spent at least 
four hours a week in, in synagogue. So being a, a part of a, a specific particular Orthodox synagogue usually uh, has, has just not occurred. It's always been important to me to have, have a, a strong relationship with particular synagogues and a particular Orthodox Jewish community. I know people for as long as I've been in L.A., so that's 30 years, I think. Yeah. So I, I know people, so I have primary experience with, with particular Jewish community getting along with particular rabbis, uh, volunteering in particular areas, uh, having, having a niche is, has been, been important to me. So I do notice a lot of my peers my age who've never married do tend to drop out of uh, practicing with the wider community in communal rituals such as such as prayer and uh, communal seders and, and other uh, specific communities, because when you belong to a specific community, there are all sorts of sorts of obligations that, that go with that. There is a significant decline in the amount of freedom that you have with every form of human connection you, you develop, whether it's with an Orthodox Jewish community or, or with a, a stamp club. So I never wanted to, to live life without community. But as far as representing the white Jewish community, it's inevitable in the, to the extent that you wear a yarmulke. So I've pretty much been wearing a yarmulke everywhere I go for about 24 years. So I, I do seek to restrain my, my behavior to that which is acceptable because it's confusing to uh, even people who aren't Orthodox Jews if you wear a yarmulke and you don't comport with the behavior that is associated with that yarmulke. So even secular, atheist, anti-religious people will feel uncomfortable if your speech and behavior differs too dramatically from what the insignia and clothing that, that you wear. Like even anti-religious, atheist people believe that religious people are more reliable and more ethical by and large. So I, I do try to comport my behavior in, in accordance with uh, my yarmulke. Did, did I address your question? Yeah, maybe I didn't clarify because even th then it depends also if people, how familiar people are with, you know, Judaism. So if you're like Michael in his area, um, most of the people that probably have very little interaction with Jews and even like African-Americans in Detroit, uh, mo you know, most of them have very little interaction with Jews. They don't necessarily know anything about it to, uh, so you might have a handful that know the Jewish community, Orthodox community, and might ask you, you know, about your people or names, <laughs> or have certain uh, you know conceptions about what it means to be Jewish. But uh, you know, to a large extent, most people don't. So uh, you know, you could kind of control your interactions and self-present your understanding of Judaism without having too much difficulty, like you know, you know, like so you know, the not you know, the you're a bad Jew type thing because uh, people don't know enough about Judaism. To even to, uh, it, it maybe in LA, like you know, d d depending on your interactions, where almost everybody, even the Gentiles, have uh, you know regular dealings and know quite a bit about uh, uh, you know Jewish communities and, and regular concerns. To where you know, you're dealing with uh, people who don't regularly have that much interaction with the Jewish community, to even to, uh, you know know about these things, like uh, you know, for example, like driving on Sabbath or something like that. You know, saying like that people don't even know that uh, Orthodox Jews don't do this. Uh, you know, like if it's in Detroit or something like that. You know, um, you know especially because there's only a small Orthodox community, and they live in just a specific neighborhood. That, uh, uh, and it's also somewhat like demographic, where you could have only liberal Jews or, or a certain type of Jews that are represented in an area as opposed to Orthodox community. Um, so I would say it's a different interaction. I mean, it depends on the situation. So, like, um, I used to be more active in the Jewish community where I would promote Jewish events. Like, you know, I would uh, invite people to synagogues or events. I would, you know, maybe at different points where I was more Zionist, I would try to sell people in Israel, um, you know, maybe even preach to them to kind of now it's like, well, you know, I'm still wearing my yarmulke, but like, I prefer not to talk about it or, uh, you, know, you know, like to bumping into Christians or something or, you know, various people that you don't know how the interaction and even this last you know debate where I, I 
I spoke to this Muslim and it was just kind of independent Jewish scholar. And, uh, you know, where I wasn't uh, representing the Jewish community. It was just, uh, you know, independent Jewish scholar and really was like the only one that he could find to talk to him. Now, in my experience, one of the, the toughest parts of, of joining Orthodox Judaism is simply learning to live life in community. So I think uh, many converts and Balei Tshuva misunderstand the nature of Orthodox Jewish life in that they, they primarily think of it in terms of religion, but the way it operates is primarily tribal. It's primarily about relationships and getting along with people and following the the tribal norms of your community. So, for example, if I go to Sydney, Australia, I meet with Sydney Jews. I talk about the, the Jews that we know in common in Los Angeles. And if you can't do that, then you're going to be regarded with, with great suspicion. Like, how, how come you're not able to uh, sustain relationships or, or know these you know, large, important members of your, your community? Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on the, the tribal communal nature of Orthodox Judaism that takes many converts and Balei Tshuva by surprise and just proves an incredibly daunting challenge. Yeah, I mean, I mean we've discussed this at length in, uh, you know, over the years, but uh, you're, you're basically fully in or, or out. And, you know, when I came back, when I was in New York, I was basically fully in. Um, and even, uh, you know, there were fellow Orthodox Jews that even knew like basically almost everyone I knew, you know, like they kept tabs on me, uh, you know, if you miss prayer service or, or any of these things, everyone through the grapevine knew, knew about it. Maybe, you know, I had certain, uh, um, you know, grace because I was a Paul Truver outsider that maybe, you know, was trying my best, but even my failures were largely public knowledge to when I came back to Detroit, I never really made it on the inside. And, you know, when, even when I went to, you know, uh, Young Israel Weekly or or even to the Orthodox community for morning prayers, I was still somewhat on the outside. And then when I went to University of Michigan, I was basically out. And then, you know, from COVID-19, I've been, I've been uh, uh, you know, fully out. And you might still bump into somebody like, you know, they don't know what happened. You bump into somebody at the store or random occasion, and they don't know that you haven't, you know, been to shul for years or what's up, or that, you know, you still have friends that uh, keep tabs on you. But, yeah, that communal life, you're basically fully in or fully out. And when you're fully in, um, you don't have privacy. Like, you, you have to, that's part of the communal tribal life is giving up on your tribe, on, on your privacy. And anything about you is, you know, basically subject to public scrutiny and can be expected to be public knowledge. Are you less likely to take people seriously if they are seriously overweight? No, I mean, because I mean, my parents were overweight most of my life. Um, so I've always had overweight friends. And, um, you know, like I've, I've seen the discrimination against overweight people. But I've made a point to uh, not discriminate. And, and, you know, obviously, you know, just growing up with my parents being uh, overweight the majority of my of my life. Although uh, my mom's got them back into shape in older years, and my my, um, and I've had a wide array of fr friends, and I even till today I have a few overweight friends, and it'll sometimes become an issue, where where uh, you know like bringing friends together, where there are other people, uh, you know I think like Andrew Tate, Sneeko, uh, but even in Orthodox Judaism, just like yeah, like I don't want to be your friend, you know like whatever, you know I mean for different people it's different things could be, you know, marijuana or, or uh, any number of issues. But, uh, you know, I, I think that there's a reasonable amount of people that just, uh, they don't like overweight people and will exclude them. Now, is it the communal, tribal, interpersonal, social demands and standards and high competitiveness of uh, Orthodox Judaism that's the most uh, daunting or challenging or uncomfortable to you? when compared to, say, the religious requirements? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the threshold of learning how to live the life is daunting. I mean, it took years, but I mean, at a certain point, I knew how to do it. And then, you know, okay, when I started going to University of Michigan, I had to cut back at doing it. And then it's somewhat like you're all in or all out. And so, you know, for a period, I was like an outsider. Then I was, you know, in communal relations, doing things 
for the community and people knew my situation where it's obviously I wasn't conforming to the rules as someone who's fully in, but it was still part of the community because I was doing useful things or I had my uh, your rabbinic leeway that uh, you are making exceptions for me uh, because, you know, either my background or, you know, in order to get ahead education or in, or in life. Um, I mean, so there's the the threshold level of just knowing how to do it, you know, like uh, all the rituals, all the laws uh, versus the, you know, the pressure of communal life that you could extrapolate to not just the Orthodox Judaism, you were talking about not having privacy, all of your affairs basically being, you know, subject to public scrutiny, public knowledge, that could be, you know, compared to any uh, tribalistic society as opposed to, you know, just the bare minimum threshold of what it means to be an Orthodox Jew and follow the rules. Uh, how would you rate your own ability for empathy? Would you say it's average, above average, or below average? Um, I would say cognitive empathy, it's above average, maybe emotional empathy, below average. So yeah. I mean, you know, we talked about like humor or something like, you know, like, I think I almost always understand what's funny, even though I don't laugh personally find it funny. So I would say, you know, like, because I've studied so much psychology and, you know, even been involved in, uh, you know, I would say cognitively, I'm, I'm quite adept at understanding, um, but, you know, so like on an emotional level, like, no, I don't, I don't really empathize, uh, you know, like on, on an emotional level. Okay, so th there's a concept called theory of mind. I'll just read from the Wikipedia in psychology, theory of mind refers to the capacity to understand other people by ascribing mental states to them. So, for example, you notice if they're happy, if they're sad, if they're confident, if they're anxious or insecure. Theory of mind includes the knowledge that others' beliefs, desires, intentions, emotions, and thoughts may be different from one's own. Possessing a functional theory of mind is crucial for success in everyday human social interactions. People use a theory of mind when analyzing, judging, and inferring others' behaviors. The discovery and development of theory of mind primarily came from studies done with uh, animals and infants. So factors include drug and alcohol consumption, language development, cognitive delays, age and culture can affect a person's capacity to display theory of mind. It is similar to, but not identical with having the capacity for empathy or sympathy. Do you have any thoughts on your own capacity for exercising theory of mind? Yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite topics, uh, you know, church of entropy. We, we talked about that. I mean, there's levels of your know, basic, you know, just any cognitive function like Piaget's stages of learning. And even like, you know, because I coach chess, a lot of uh, young kids, even from three to, you know, as young as three years old through through high school to see these stages of development where, you know, you have to project what's going on in another person's mind to interact, uh, you know, call it predictive coding. Um, and that's why I separated like a cognitive empathy sometimes or sympathy, you, I guess the different words, uh, you were actually, you have an emotional response to just a cognitive understanding that, uh, you know, so, uh, um, and then even like the multiple truth hypothesis to recognize, uh, you know, I had these arguments with Claire or other people related to my debate with Islam, that you could never really know what's on another person's heart. You could never really know if your theory of mind is accurate. It's just more, you know, some theory like predictive processing, the better it is at making predictions. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I, I love that topic. I'm not exactly sure what, which direction you're asking. If you, I mean, if you're talking like specific empathy or sympathy to a level where I'm not sure if you're, you mean like you could be like, Freud or something who's detached and could have great theories about what's causing the other person to act the way they are, but has no emotional, you know, completely, uh, um, uh, you know, aloof or separate with no emotional connection. I'm probably much more in that camp. And what have been the most meaningful uh, streaming moments from the last time that we spoke, the, the most, say, uh, meaningful uh, live streams you've done or, or participated in? over the last uh, couple of months? I had my big debate uh, on my first debate on modern day debate where I presented Judaism and I felt pretty good about that. Like I made a whole, I, I prepared like a whole month 
um, you know, he put out that he wanted a Jewish debater. And I've been trying to get a modern day debate for a long time. You know, Church of Entropy was on there like multiple times. A, a lot of people, you know, you're doing, a, you know, Stephen Bennell, Destiny. He's a, a regular. I had almost uh, debated Destiny. Like he had tried to set it up because I wanted to debate the UAW strike. And I was going to be on the side of management. And he couldn't get someone to uh, uh, represent uh, the union. And he had asked both Fausch and Destiny if they wanted to do it. And neither one did. Um, but, uh, you know, the debate ended up being postponed. So I had a long time to prepare and I felt that, you know, kind of interesting, you know, my, my chance to present Judaism. And then it was kind of like a JQ type debate, but it was interesting because this time it was against a Muslim and it was against a Muslim who went to Harvard divinity school. So he had a whole like series. I mean, it's kind of like a radical Muslim. However, his arguments against Judaism, <coughs> were compiled from a whole bunch of sources, you know, not just like alt-right talking points or specific Islamic talking points, but kind of like the best of uh, modern, uh, you know, religious studies criticism that comes out of Harvard. Um, so I enjoyed that. I got a lot of, uh, I got new followers, people watching, um, you know, Islamic feedback, a lot of views, uh, got my viewership up. That, that's really the only thing I've had in, in the last little while a few Twitter spaces here or there. I've been kind of avoiding them, like the war going on. They're mostly repetitive. Um, there's a guy, Albert Bashai, who is doing like daily anti-Israel spaces. Adam Green's joining occasionally. But uh, you know, it's kind of just like the same talking points again and again. Um, so I've been kind of falling out of streaming besides for that one big debate, which actually numbers-wise is the, my biggest performance uh, you know, to date, this guy. you know, And, and as I mentioned, you know, he has over 400,000 combined followers on his following. And the day that uh, the debate was on modern day debate, the ADL decided to uh, put like this hit piece out against him. So, uh, you know, that attracted more attention. Um, but even that I would say was limited. Like, uh, yeah, I think I got a few more subs, a few more people tuning into my program. But even though, uh, you know, that itself had a huge amount of viewership, it didn't attract that many people over to my platform. So I'm still kind of doing the same boring week in review, talking about uh, you know studies and psychology, and and, and the war. Like I'm I'm doing the war, a regular war update in Israel. So I feel pretty you know good in terms of keeping up uh, with what's going on in Israel. And and what have been your your primary intellectual interests? Well, specifically, I started a new series on metaphysics. And I've been finding it fascinating, like, you know, it's decent viewership, like not great, but like, uh, uh, you know, enough that I've, I, I keep it going. And I've been doing one on just topics in metaphysics, uh, you know, which is kind of like a forgotten lost wisdom. And, uh, and then also like a, a biography series, which I've been doing a lot of research and I've been covering really the canon of Western thought. And I've been reading, uh, you know, I probably more research and reading than I've ever done in my life. And I found that, like, yeah, you know, I've been seriously studying this stuff for years. Like, I know a significant amount about the Western canon, and especially uh, the philosophy of science, uh, logic, uh, philosophy. And uh, you know, so I enjoy I enjoy that, but it's kind of lonely you know, at this point, because like even, to, you know, these great Western thinkers, uh, most people never even heard of them. And what's the most important book or essay that you've read this year? I read so much. I'm not sure that one thing's more important than the other. Um, you know, like the philosophy of mind is actually the most interesting to me. That's why I wanted to get into metaphysics is to, un, you know, like the, the center of metaphysics is like the the first principles first rules and the question of these paradoxes uh you know what's the basis of uh our understanding you know epistemology ontology and uh most related to the theory of mind and you know i'm leaning dualist that i think the mind is a non-physical product so uh you know i i i looked into detail like this vienna circle that included 
a significant amount of Jews, but, but not necessarily, not like the Frankfurt circle. It's only maybe like 20, 30% Jewish that largely created philosophy of science and certain things I'd never really looked into detail, but now I have like, uh, uh, you know, Wittgenstein, um, Frege, uh, Bertrand Russell, maybe last time we talked, we talked about Bertrand Russell, um, you know, because like William James, I was looking at German idealism, uh, like Lutze in uh, Windelbelm, uh, a lot of Kant. Like I didn't realize how important Kant was, but like I probably read 20 books on Kant or like Kant's followers and, uh, you know, to really delve into, uh, you know, these like uh, transcendental idealism, a priori, posteriori, uh, you know, different ideas that I'd heard about. I even read a little bit in high school, but like, you know, I finally did a you know, deep dive into this research and kind of like the German idealism. And it also kind of enlightening on the JQ to see this kind of, uh, you know, counter that German idealism kind of leads into the Nazi movement, although it's not necessarily uh, in op it, it's just a philosophy way of looking the world that could be you know, considered uh, opposite the Jewish way of looking at things. So that that's been very enlightening to me also. Okay, any uh, final words for today, David? I'm going to move on. Yeah, happy Passover. You know, like uh, you, know, God forbid, the war. You know, it's a disaster. It looks like it's going to keep on getting worse, and it puts us in a weird situation. You know, being Jewish, because I, I found that you know, basically overwhelms almost all aspects of Jewish identity. Because like you know, now, you know, people think Jewish see the yarmulke, they think the war in Israel. So, uh, you know, I'm covering it in detail. We can review, talking about it, kind of doing uh, you know public soul searching and my uh, research, but, uh, you know, good to keep in contact. Appreciate you having me on. Have a, you know, kosher, uh, you know, blessings on all your paths. Okay. Thank you so much, David. Good to catch up with you. Want to get back here to decoding the gurus, decoding the live streamer destiny, AKA Steve Bunnell. Yeah. I think that's an interesting distinction. I mean, we've spoken to people recently, Chris, who, who are very much pro Israel in this, on this issue. Oh, and, Sam and, Harris. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was be, I was being, I was being delicate. Um, you were being arch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, not even referring to Sam Harris in particular, but just looking at the discourse, it does seem like a lot of people are firmly in one camp or firmly in the other camp. And one thing you see almost uh, ubiquitously is that they will minimize or make excuses for or change the topic or whatever on, on anything that sort of makes the one side look bad. So I think perhaps one thing with Destiny is that he seems to dive in is quite happy to punch in both directions. Yeah, although I think people would argue that he does engage in like, you know, some apologetics for Israeli actions. It, it, you know, it all depends on where you're, how you judge what is actually going on there and like how but you trust statements from different sources. But um, on that same stream, Matt, so, you know, we heard Hassan interacting with his audience and getting annoyed with them, right, whenever they were challenging his position. This does sound a little bit similar <laughs> at points to when Destiny gets annoyed with his audience. So listen, this is from the same stream. We shouldn't want the war to stop. You should want the... You should want the elimination of Hamas. You should, if you, if you don't want, if you want anything less than Hamas being removed as the administrator to the Gazan region, you are a pedophile who is jerking off to dying Palestinians because you think it supports whatever perverted political narrative that you have for hating America. That's literally it. That's, there is no other rational basis, be, or you're anti-Semitic and you hate Jews, I guess, or maybe you're a uh, crazy Muslim or whatever, um, or, or super anti-Semitic and you, for whatever, or some other reason, you can be a Christian, be a Nazi, I guess, right? That's the only, there's no other option there. If you support Hamas remaining as the administrator here, it's because you are dropping fat loads of thick cum, okay, all over your fucking carpet at night, watching Palestinians die. But it gives you something to tweet about every night. Now, that is what we might <laughs> refer to as loaded rhetoric. <laughs> like, in this case, very loaded. Right? <laughs> like, uh, and and I, I think also that clip highlights that that's not the kind of commentary that you're going to hear from Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson or whatever, right? They're not going to be talking about people spunking fat loads on their carpet over dead <laughs> infants, right? So... Destiny doesn't mind engaging in that, like, really heated dismissal. 
if he feels like it's justified. So like in that case, he's basically arguing there's no... Right. Who whom is what it boils down to. Whose side are you on? If you're primarily on the side of uh, Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians, then you're going to look for ways to justify and have sympathy and empathy with, with Hamas, unless you've concluded that Hamas is against the, the best interests of Palestinians, Muslims, and uh, Arabs. So who who? Like, whose side are you on? What's your hero system? That's going to determine your, your reaction to Hamas, not objective you know, things that Hamas does. Right? And if you're, you're pro-Israel, of course, you're going to find this kind of Palestinian terrorism abominable. But uh, people who don't take a side... Right. They may very well think that oppressed peoples, and you can make strong arguments that Palestinians are oppressed peoples, you would think, look, it's normal, natural, and even healthy for oppressed peoples to react with, with violence against their oppressors. Principled position that can lead to supporting Hamas remaining in power, and then essentially characterizing anybody that would argue that as being a pedophile, yeah. well, somebody that yeah. masturbates over dead children or whatever. But it's all it's for rhetorical effect but like yeah that that is illustrative of like interacting with the audience in a very harsh way and characterizing positions which they're right people don't want the same level of discourse all right people go to live streams for that for some of that shocking talk all right you, you don't read a phone bill the same way you read a love letter people want different types of discourse you don't talk the same way in a locker room as you do in in a boardroom and, you know, people want that, that raw animal energy that uh, Destiny just displayed. As completely amoral. Like, the, I don't think that's steel manning the kind of position. Yeah, I mean, I could, but, you know, I guess you're talking about Hamas, the organization, perhaps as a person. Well, sure. To... Look, I can do a better job of it. I'm no fan of Hamas, right? But, like... I can see that people could argue that removing Hamas will lead to a political vacuum, which will actually just empower more extremists and lead to a worse outcomes for Israel. And that didn't require me jacking off to dead children or being an anti-American, you know, ideologue. So on the other hand, if you want to be influential, you have to learn the code of the people who have power and you have to pay respect to them. Right, you just usually can't go in and say, "Hey, you guys who have power, right? You're all a bunch of retards who are dropping, you know, thick loads on on the carpet, right? That's that's not a way to become influential. You have to learn to speak and to write effectively if you are primarily interested in being effective with elites. That's the, the point of uh, Larry McInerney, the, the director of the University of Chicago writing program, until he retired a few Said years ago. To you. Oh, your work was so valuable. Thank you. They were lying. <laughs> no, they were lying. It was valuable to them, but it was valuable to them because they learned that people misunderstood things in ways they had no idea people could misunderstand things. <laughs> <laughs> no. Faculty sometimes look at me and say, oh, no, no, Larry, you're wrong. No, 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 student writing is actually, actually professionally valuable. I say, then, did you publish it? Then if you didn't, it's plagiarism. And they say, well, no, actually, it wasn't that valuable. Look, here's the problem you've got. Yeah, your writing needs to be clear, sure. Your writing needs to be organized. The rules that govern this are not what you think they are. In fact, they're not rules. Yes, your writing needs to be persuasive. This is way more important than this. But more than anything else, from now on, your writing needs to be valuable. Because if it's not that, nothing else matters. It makes zero difference. Faculty come into my office, and forgive me for the drama, but in my... Okay, so the primary aim of my live streams, generally speaking, is not self-expression, it's not clarity, it's not organization, it's not persuasion. I primarily want to create something of value. In my office, there's two chairs in the writing corner. I have a chair at my desk, and then there's two chairs over here. There's my chair, and then there's the writer's chair, and next to the writer's chair, is a box of Kleenex. And I'm not kidding. Because I have people coming to me saying, I'm not getting, they're not accepting my proposal, they're not accepting my draft. I get faculty who come in and say, they're not 
publishing my work. And of course there's Kleenex there because like, you know, careers are depending on it. All right, so I have a small audience, but my audience is composed probably at least 5% five, 5 of professors. And my audience is probably composed of at least a minimum of 10% of professionals because I have learned to speak the code for these professions of people who make a significant difference in the world around us when compared to, say, skinhead high school dropouts. And sometimes it's because it's not clear, and sometimes it's because it's not organized, and sometimes it's because it's not persuasive, but overwhelmingly it's because it's not valuable. And the other stuff doesn't matter. If it's clear and useless, it's useless. If it's organized and useless, it's useless. If it's persuasive and useless, it's useless. That's what it is. Now, this terrifies people because they make the mistake. Fortunately, I'm talking to social scientists. Physical scientists don't have this mistake. They think value lies here. They think, oh my god, what if my ideas just aren't valuable? That's dopey. <laughs> There's no such thing as value here. Value is here. The question is whether this particular community of readers values it, which is why it's so much about readers and not about content. Can you imagine writing a text which one group? If you want to be successful, you have to pay primary attention to your potential audience. A group of readers thinks is terrifically useful, and another group of readers thinks it's useless? Well, yeah, I gotta tell you. Sometimes PhD students come into my office and say, I really gotta get this article published. I'm under so much pressure to publish, I gotta publish. And I say, okay, what journals are you gonna submit it to? And they look at me and say, what does that matter? <laughs> because they think it needs to be clear. It needs to be organized. It needs to be persuasive. And those are just sort of in the thing itself. Or anybody could look at it and decide it's clear. That's crazy wrong, but most importantly is valuable. Value lies in readers, right? Not in the thing. And so how people can think about their writing without thinking about readers is probably the biggest challenge you face. You've been trained to think about writing formally, rule governed. You have to stop and you have to think about readers. Not generic readers, God help you if you came up in a system with standardized tests where you had to write papers for a standardized reader, like on an AP test or an SAT test. That's disastrous because it specifically teaches you not to think about any differences between readers. We are going to be talking about differences between readers and thinking about those differences. Because that's what I think is how writing actually works, except in the bizarre world of standardized testing. So uh, I'm going to pass these out. OK, turn to the first page. And here's what I want to do. Very quickly, I want to imagine that this is a group of, uh, by the way, any biologists in the group? Wonderful, because biologists have to leave. Um, <laughs> no, this is a, this is a, this is a, a test about, it has to do with content, it has to do with biology. And I don't want you to know anything about it, because I want you to be responding to the language, the writing of it. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to read two p imagined uh, contenders for a grant or publication, and we're going to decide which of these two we're going to publish. Okay? I'm going to read. You stay with me as I read. 1A. As a consequence of the cost of sex, the theoretical probability of clonal and sexual coexistence is low. This is not sociology. This is biology. <laughs> as a consequence of the cost of sex, the theoretical probability in clonal of clonal and sexual coexistence is low. Observation of coexistence in vertebrate taxa has been reported. Within the frozen niche variation model, the relevant parameter is difference in overall niche breadth. A wider niche breadth for the sexuals and for the clones is predicted in performances in monocultures. Performances in mixtures do not indicate such a relationship. Switching of behaviors or resource use patterns between mixed and pure cultures may be the cause. The post study will examine the predictions of the FNV model. OK, as again, I hope you didn't understand any of that. 1B. As a consequence of the cost of sex, the theoretical probability of clonal and sexual coexistence is low. Nonetheless, observation of coexistence in vertebrate taxa has been widely reported. All right, this is the type of writing that's going to get a grant, that is going to get published because of the use of words like, nonetheless, it, it's purporting to offer something of value. 
Within the accepted model of frozen niche variation, coexistence is explained by difference in overall niche breadth. However, although the FNV model correctly predicts wider niche breadth for the Right, however, although these are also code words that uh, academic elites want to hear. The sexuals and for the clones, its predictions are inconsistent with reported performances in mixtures. The proposed study will examine whether the anomaly may be explained by the switching of behaviors or research use. Right, anomaly, another key word that uh, elites in this particular area respond to. These patterns between mixed and pure cultures. Which of these we're going to be more likely to fund? Second, Second one, of course, why? Now tell me why. It offers value. It offers value. Right? Uh, elites making foreign policy decisions are going to be moved by discussions of uh, people dropping big, thick loads on the carpet. That's yeah. what I mean. You can take him as simply arguing against the worst version of the kind of tanky left, which is who I think he's aimed at. But the rhetoric is very strong. Yeah. The rhetoric is colorful. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I sound like I'm making excuses here, but uh, I used to play a game called Subspace back in the day. It was one of the very first multiplayer games mm -hmm. where you could actually type and text other players. And all right, when you're playing a video game, all right, that brings out a different side of you than when you're meditating or when you're in church or when you're in the boardroom or when you're in the locker room, right? You're going to speak and think differently. And there would be maybe 100, 200 people playing. And the culture in that game, in terms of the absolutely disgusting language that everybody used, I think we'll yeah. mainly play. And, and in fact, I, I found myself and my brother too, we would just find ourselves participating in it in the same kind of thing. Like it was all ironic and tongue in cheek and, you know, all that stuff. But at, at some point I just stopped and went, hang on, I'm Probably the people I'm playing with are like 14 years old or something. <laughs> what, they, what am I doing? Yeah. Um, but I, I guess my point is, is that internet... Okay, I'm looking over at uh, the live stream on Odyssey where we have a more wide open uh, discussion that's allowed. And so there's a point, why are so many Orthodox men completely huge and fat? Well, I think Orthodox Judaism and Seventh-day Adventism say re remove so many pleasures that are permitted by secular society that people perhaps depend an inordinate amount on getting pleasure and comfort from food. Right? Also, so many events and key rituals in Judaism take place among food. Jews don't tend to drink to excess, and there are other vices that are not supposed to engage in such a sexual promiscuity, so they will often compensate by seeking more pleasure and more comfort from the consumption of food than is aligned with their best interests. So the Odyssey chat says, I've seen so many Orthodox men with what looks like a size 55 waist. If my mother's mother observed Levitical dietary law, does that make you a Jew? No, but if your mother is Jewish, that makes you a Jew. You're a Jew depending upon genetic lineage, right? It's not religious observance that makes you a Jew. The only exception is if, you are one of those rare people who can convert to Judaism and then getting aligned with the program of observance will make that conversion a lot easier. I wonder if observing the 613 commandments cultivates OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder probably uh, cultivates OCD. It also would likely be more appealing to people who already have OCD tendencies. Those two possibilities, I think the second one is stronger. I've noticed what seems to be a disproportionate amount of neuroticism, autism, and Asperger's within the Jewish population. I think you're primarily talking about the Ashkenazi Jewish population, and there are all sorts of health defects that go along with extraordinary high average Ashkenazi intelligence. So, so traits don't just have one manifestation. All right, You don't just get to have high average intelligence, but not have some negative traits that correlate with that. Right? If, if you have a section of the brain that's much bigger than what uh, other people's have that enables you to be superior with regard to tracking and visual processing, right, that expansion in one area of the brain is going to come at a cost to other areas of your brain. Right? If you adapt to your environment to be superb at uh, dealing with a particular environment, that will likely come at a cost of your ability to thrive in a different environment. And second, and unrelated, I just 
Recall another great advantage of ADHD medication. My lustful impulse has been obliterated. My lustful in- impulse has been genocided. My lustful impulse has been destroyed. It is completely gone. I am able to live a life that's uh, overwhelmingly free from lust thanks to my ADHD medication. <laughs> so so there, there are negative side effects from medication, but there are also positive side effects. I think uh, most men would be quite happy to have their lustful impulse overwhelmingly obliterated because it, it seems to be much more of a nuisance than, than a blessing. That subcultures have... have yeah, yeah, different edgy norms. lingo. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and being edgy is a component of it. It is absolutely the case. And But this is a point, like, Destiny's not going to drop that kind of language on his interview with Jordan Peterson. But on the stream, he will. And just one more clip about kind of chastising the audience, the highlight streamer dynamics. The difference is that we aren't providing military support to Hamas. Yes, you are, you f***ing retard. What are you talking about? The, uh, the Gaza Strip gets more humanitarian aid than any other region of the world per capita what do you mean you're providing support for them how do you think the leaders get fucking rich by reselling a whole bunch of shit that goes into the country why do you think these people are in qatar in, in twenty thousand dollar private plane jets uh, in, in one thousand dollar night what do you mean we're not providing any money to hamas you're f-ing retarded just because only certain types of supplies go in there doesn't mean you're not funding the military there that's doing what they're doing how do you think they have the money to build all the tunnels how do you think they have the money to get all the f-ing guns what are you talking about like jesus right so there are some ways where youtube offers you know much freer conversations and fewer restrictions than talk radio or Fox News. Uh, On the other hand, as we saw with Tucker Carlson's run at Fox News, you can say things on Fox that Tucker Carlson said things on Fox that will get you immediately terminated from Switch and uh, very likely terminated from YouTube. I said military support. I'm going to permaban you so that you've got all the time in the world. I want you to go online and Google fungibility of money. Go look it up. Be a smarter person for it. I'll see you in five years. Good luck. Yeah, hmm. so I think the reason you're playing these clips is, is not so much about the topic at hand, but rather to illustrate, I guess, the dynamic that some, at, least, at least sometimes exists. The point is not to say that's the normal interaction. It isn't. But just like the Simon Hassan is not always going off on a huge rant at his audience, like, the, you're all fucking fascists, right? Like, that doesn't happen all the time. But <laughs> this kind of thing does happen and there again i understand the frustration because like what destiny was talking about on that stream was he's arguing against people essentially presenting israel as they would intentionally want to blow up it so looking at uh, fox news in the background ted cruz is speaking apparently he's seeking a third senate term didn't chuck johnson say there are various personal issues in ted cruz's life that will prevent him from running for president of the united states did Chuck Johnson say that uh, Ted Cruz was going to retire? But it's true. You can have all sorts of personal issues in your life that won't be stopping you from running for public office for all public offices, right? There's a lot less personal scrutiny when you're running for U.S. Senate than when you're running for the presidency. So whatever personal issues Ted Cruz has in his life that's preventing him from running for the presidency, again, uh, apparently not deterring him from running for a third term in the U.S. Senate. Trucks, knowing that they're aid trucks because they're, you know, like an evil government that just wants Palestinian people to starve and die. So, like... Comment in the chat, Destiny, raising his voice is a bad sign. I remember that would always be (laughs) used against me when when I was younger. People would say, ah, you're you're raising your voice, you're you're yelling. Uh, that, That shows you've already lost the argument. I hated that. My my father did a PhD in rhetoric, so my father was particularly skilled with rhetoric, and I have not done a PhD in rhetoric. In addition, my father is was considerably smarter than me, so he's both better educated, better educated in rhetoric, smarter than me, more physically robust, and so he would tend to win our arguments. They don't even care that's in truck, and he's saying that's a stupid position because it's counterproductive. For in so many ways, even if they wanted that, targeting aid trucks is going to get them just in trouble from international community, as you saw what, what happened right in the backlash to that. So he's reacting to that, but in so doing, 
it felt to me like the person commenting there was trying to say, right. I've been surprised how overwhelmingly pro-Israel Fox News has been since October 7. Because you, you could talk about the rise of anti-Israel protests. You could, you could present it that way, or you could also equally say the rise of pro-Palestinian protests, right? If you're pro-Palestinian, effectively, you're going to be anti-Israel. If you're pro-Israel, effectively, you're going to be anti-Palestinian, all right? You've got two groups who both have strong ties to a particular area of land, and they are both engaged in what looks like a zero-sum battle. So effectively, this is how much of the world works. This is how the world works. You have different groups with different interests, and sometimes the clash of interests between groups, when they are forced to live together or next to each other, will be so intense that you get mass killing. But, you know, the West is supporting Israel financially and militarily. And then Disney, like, deflects that onto, right, yeah. but Gaza is receiving it. But Gaza is receiving, yes, it does receive aid from, you know, international sources, but, it, it, like, a lot of its stuff for, comes from Iran and, you know, various things. So, like, I think the person commenting has a more valid argument yeah. than Destiny presents it as. And then he, he kind of, like, it is engaging in rhetoric a bit to be like, Right. People don't usually tune into a live stream for the philosophical rigor of the arguments, right? They, they tune in for a visceral experience. They, they tune in for information, but they primarily want to feel something. They want an emotional, visceral experience. They want to be part of a community. They want spectacle and drama and excitement. Right. It's not, not primarily rigor, intellectual rigor, that attracts people to live streams look how rich the people are so you don't think they're getting any money and it's like well that's not the exact argument right surely the the argument yeah. is that we militarily support yeah. israel directly so yeah, uh, yeah. we're more culpable yeah the u.s yeah. this is but that's right this is why israel has f-35s and <laughs> hamas does not um yeah no i take your point that and going back thinking about the comments here on Odyssey, why are so many Orthodox men completely huge and fat? Or you could also say about Orthodox women, except in Chabad. For some reason, the Lubavitch branch of Hasidic Judaism disproportionately attracts and develops uh, attractive women. It's like the Seventh-day Adventist church, right? It's a religion that's two-thirds women, and they tend to be quite attractive. So why are there so many overweight uh, Orthodox men and women. I noticed that too in my journey into Jewish life in general. I was kind of taken aback that it seemed empirically, at least the first Jews that I got to know, well, the first Jews that I, I would see when I went to synagogue, I was taken aback that they seemed to be shorter than the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants that I was used to, and they tended to be heavier. They also tended to be more blunt in their speech and to be more emotionally intense. The point that the person in the audience was making it was almost certainly a more reasonable one than the one that Destiny demolished. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, there was a five-year ban, right? This is one of the things that can happen, right? Like, because, you know, little chat box or whatever is going, and then you say... Right, I'm kicking you out. Off you go. And you do that to one person, you can get annoyed or whatever, but you are conditioning your audience about what will happen. And like that's part of the dynamics that end up in these communities. And I, I think Destiny is very tolerant in a lot of ways of pushback, but but essentially gets intolerant about certain subjects eventually, right? Like gets fed up and is like, I want... Yeah, everyone's got a hero system. And so for many people who dominate public discourse, Israel is a key part of their hero system. And it's the one area that you can't cross them and maintain any kind of relationship. So people tend to develop parasocial relationships with their favorite live streamers, right? Parasocial interaction, according to Wikipedia, refers to a kind of psychological relationship experienced by an audience in their mediated encounters with performers in the mass media, particularly on television and on online platforms. Viewers come to consider these performers friends despite having no or limited interactions with them. So parasocial interaction is an illusory experience such that uh, members of the audience interact with personas, right? When I'm doing a show, I'm putting on a show. 
I'm a different person in my private life in some ways, right? And people tend to relate to these performance personas as if they are engaged in a reciprocal relationship. So parasocial interaction is an exposure to something in the mass media or online that garners interest in a particular persona, right? It turns into frequently a parasocial relationship if you get repeated exposure to the media persona causing the media user to develop illusions of intimacy, friendship, and identification. Positive information learned about the media persona results in increased attention and the relationship progresses. Uh, parasocial relationships are enhanced due to trust and self-disclosure vulnerability provided by the media persona. Media users tend to be loyal and feel directly connected to the persona, much as they feel connected to their close real-life friends, and it's from observing and interpreting the media persona's appearance, gestures, voice, conversation, and conduct. So media personas tend to have a significant amount of influence over media users, and there are many positive and negative effects of parasocial relationships. So the more empty your real life, the more likely you are to develop intense and frequently harmful parasocial relationships. So there's a Netflix number one show right now is Baby Reindeer uh, about uh, a struggling stand-up comic who gets a stalker, right? And so the type of people who are particularly predisposed to stalkers are people who are seeking attention. And initially the stalker provides attention and fills up some kind of need in you, right? The less need you have for an audience to provide you with attention, right? The less likely you are to tra trigger stalkers and unhealthy attention. Dennis Prager deliberately tries to cultivate a parasocial relationship with his audience, right? He wants to be a virtual friend and a virtual father figure, and this gives him more influence, but it comes at the price of all sorts of people develop disproportionate and unhealthy parasocial fixations on him, which uh, I'm sure has often been a pain for Dennis Prager, and I'm sure that's also true for me. I think I, at times I developed an unhealthy parasocial uh, relationship with Dennis Prager, even though I you know, knew him a little bit in real life. We were never friends, right? We were never close, but you know, we, we did have good relations for, for years. I remember when I first met him, he said, oh, look, you know, I, I feel like I can die happy knowing that there will be people like you who will carry on the work. I don't know how many countless dozens of people he may have said that to, but uh, it, was, it was overwhelming when I heard that back in ah, February 1994, when I first met Dennis Prager in person, it was at a conservative synagogue in Tampa Bay. Anybody that will make this kind of stupid argument, either the community, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you think this can happen, Chris? This is a genuine question. We talk about cultish dynamics and the somewhat unhealthy social dynamics that can happen between gurus and their audience. But I can also see how that kind of behavior on the part of destiny, one could fall into it easily. You know, it's the sixth hour of your stream. You're, oh, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're, you're scanning hundreds of text messages and you lose your shit and it, and it becomes a, becomes a habit. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's absolutely a kind of component and it's necessary even in, a, in some respect if you become a popular streamer because otherwise, you know, you're just going to be dealing with hassle constantly. So you have to, you have to have moderators, you have to have like ground rules and red lines and all that kind of thing. And I think in the same way that like a lot of people start out on Twitter or other social media being like, I'm never gonna ban anyone. I'm not gonna mute anyone. I'm gonna be very nice. And then like after a number of years, the people are just like, right, block for minor <laughs> infractions, right? Because <laughs> they're just fed up. Or if their audience gets bigger, they just, negative comment right gone and and i i don't mean to say that destiny is unique in this i do think it's a component of streamer platforms when you're big but just maybe all social media platforms where you're engaging with your audience but you know we played examples of hassan you know chastising his audience so it only feels fair to show that it's not like destiny never does that even if you think he's justified in some case. So there's that. I don't know what position that would it actually give in terms of like where Destiny's politics lie. But I, there is a, a famous clip of him 
<laughs> and this is also, I feel a little bit unfair, so I apologize um, that these clips are coming at the start, but this is a famous clip of Destiny complaining about how he needs to modulate himself when dealing with right-wing conservative people that are in his audience, right? So it's the same thing about the audience dynamics, but going in, in a different direction. So this is like a kind of famous clip. I don't know the original stream it's from, but listen to this. Destiny, you have all the talking points, but none of the substance. Trump is the physical manifestation of the Republicans' frustration with the left. But go ahead and set up another Democrat to deplatform people even further so that even an even worse Republican can come out of the ashes fight against the left retard. Here is my problem, not racy, okay? I have an ungodly amount of patience, okay? I have an ungodly amount of patience. What you don't see is that every single fucking day on my stream, 10% of my brain has to go towards being an intelligent and smart individual that is equipped. Right, Destiny is very smart, so he can apportion, say, 10% of his brain to, to do the thinking that, that he describes. I think he's highly self-aware. Whipping himself with facts and data to have intelligent and reasonable conversations about topics, and 90% of my brain goes towards trying to understand how you all became such triggered, remedial fucking snowflakes so that I can navigate a conversation gently enough with you to not set your fucking brain off so that you're incapable I remember one day I was walking and it started raining and I just wanted to walk through the rain because I just wanted to feel something. All right? I was kind of feeling dulled by hours and hours of, of work and I, I just wanted to feel something. And so I walked for, for miles through the rain and I was absolutely miserable. I was wearing my sunglasses and the rain would somehow pool in my sunglasses and so it made everything foggy and it was just a horrible, horrible experience, but it was, it was brought about because I just wanted to feel something. And I think people often tune into a visceral shock jock type of, of live stream because they just want to feel something. ...of hearing what anybody else has to say. That's what I spend most of my time on. That's what I spend most of my time thinking about. You understand? I have, it's like hurting a, a, a fucking group of kindergartners and trying to figure out what I can say to you so that it doesn't set you the fuck off. Because what I really want to say, when we talk about things like, hey, this is how I have to have a conversation about hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin with fucking... Right, this is how you become a successful live streamer, right? You just start spilling almost everything that goes through your head and you say it with great intensity and passion and this becomes compelling. It right? doesn't, doesn't necessarily encourage you know, strong logical argumentation, right? but it is emotionally compelling. People want spectacle and this is spectacle. Remedial dipshits like you. This is what I have to say. I understand. Fauci and the CDC, they did get some things wrong. And it's really bullshit that like some of the media, they have like a bias. And I totally understand why you can have like a mistrust in government when they act in the ways that they do, when they act kind of smug, when a lot of the politicians and the media seem to be on the same page. I understand the frustration there. And then when you've got other figures like Joe Rogan, who are willing to platform voices that are unpopular, platform voices that don't get voiced as much, opinions don't get voiced as much. When you hear these people talk, you, you have this inclination to trust them a little bit more because they're willing. Right? I don't believe any of that. I hate that. I hate that. I hate doing that. Every fucking day I come on stream. What I really want to say is, oh, you think that these are good drugs? Let's look at the studies. Oh, you're fucking retarded. That's it. You don't have RCTs. You don't have perspective RCTs to support ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. You're a fucking moron. You know what you are? You're so triggered by a 92-year-old fucking limp dick Fauci going up on TV talking. that you So an RCT is a randomized controlled trial. It's essentially the equivalent of A-B testing. You're about to eat any fucking pill that a fucking meathead like Joe Rogan will tell you to eat. That's what I really want to say to you. But I can't say that. I have to communicate to you like you're a triggered fucking five-year-old. You know what, how, you know how frustrating that is? Every fucking day I come on stream and I talk to you, I have to figure out what is the nicest fucking way I can communicate to you so your brain will function at the 10% capacity it's capable of just to understand the fucking things that I'm telling you. It is so fucking frustrating. Holy shit. I understand why Trump is popular. It's because you're triggered. Admit it, but you won't even admit that. The reality is, is that you're fucking triggered that a couple people on TV get a few things wrong sometimes and that some other smug dipshit progressives who are smug and who are dipshits act like smug dipshits that you want to go as far off in the other direction as possible. And then I have to find a way to rope you back in. Like I'm a fucking... <sighs> okay, this is highly effective discourse for appealing to a mass audience. It's not highly effective discourse at appealing to an elite audience that actually changes the world. So you can do a live stream for one person, and if they're a member of the elite in the society, right, that live stream will have more influence than a live stream that captures the attention of you know, one million high school dropouts. Right? The, the demands of, of the elite are very different from 
the demands of those just seeking intensity. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really big on particular words, right? Important. Right. If you want to succeed in your communication with the elite, you have to share the type of words that resonate for them, right? There's a code. Every group has a code, and you have to speak the code if you want to be, be effective in the way things work. Right? First thing you say. Now, imagine if you're the writer of 1A, and we said to her, your work doesn't seem important. What's her likely response? You obviously didn't understand. <laughs> you obviously didn't understand. And we said, all right, fix it. Make it better. What is, this is crucial. What is that writer likely to do if we said, we didn't, un it's not important, and the writer thinks you didn't understand it. They are about to make a gigantic mistake because they would do what? What do you do when somebody says to you, I don't understand? You explain. Do not do that. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> Why do I not want you to explain? And by the way, why did your teachers want you to explain? Why did your teachers want you to explain stuff? Because they wanted to know whether you understood it. You guys don't know how to explain stuff. You explain stuff under the model of demonstrating to somebody that you understand it. That's how you've learned to explain. You don't even know you know that you've done this. You have learned that what explaining is, it's revealing to the world the inside of your head. No one cares about the inside of your head. Okay, no one in elite circles cares about the inside of your head, no matter the particular elite circle. Now, if you're just trying to get a mass audience and you are viscerally compelling, right, you can just a rate as, as destiny does and you'll get that mass audience but you'll have no effect on the people who decide how the world is going forward at least not unless you pay us if you pay us to care we will care right but in the real world you're going to stop paying your readers to care about the inside of your head here's a shock you think writing is conveying your ideas. It's not. Let me say that again. You think that writing is communicating your ideas to your readers. It is not. What is professional writing? Professional writing. What is it? It's not conveying your ideas to your readers. <laughs> It's changing their ideas. So Ronnie Goldman, when he was at Stanford Law, he, he developed the ideas that went into his magnum opus, Conservative Claims of Cultural Oppression, but he was not willing to bend his arguments to the code of, of the ruling elite. And so he was not able to have any direct effect on the people who hire law school faculty, right? He, because he refused to, to bend to their code, he had to go out into the wider world, and, and he could not join the academic elite. Nobody cares what ideas you have. This is way more radical than it sounds. I used to make the mistake of saying to students who came in, I teach argument a lot, and I say to students who make an argument, why do you think that? And then I realize this is a horrible question. It's a teacherly question. A teacher says, why do you think that? Because the teacher wants to know what? What's in his head? I said, oh my God, I'm doing the same thing. So now I don't say to him, why do you think that? I say now, why should I think that? Because I think that. <laughs> And guess what? That doesn't work. Right? Which is interesting why it doesn't work in academia. Why doesn't it work in academia? Why doesn't that work? 
So academia pays virtually no attention to popular discourse, right? The discourse of 99.9% .9 of the population has no effect on the people who dominate communities of advanced learning and knowledge. Of professionals. This is a great question, right? Why is it that I don't say, okay, you think it, I'll think it. Why does that not work in, I mean, at least it's not supposed to work. In, sometimes it works. But why is it not supposed to work in an academic realm? Because we all stubborn. Because what? We are all stubborn. Well, that's probably why it does work, but that's not why it's supposed to work. Because there's a rule of Western academia, it's rule that's of course broken in the breach a million times, but the rule says nothing will be accepted as knowledge or understanding until it has been challenged by someone competent to challenge it. Right, nothing will be accepted as knowledge until it has been challenged by someone competent to challenge it. Just a great point about the nature of reality. Yeah. Fuck, I hate it. I hate, I hate having to, it is so irritating that I have to spend so much of my brain to be a gentle remedial rancher that I've got to go out into the fields and I've got to figure the gentlest way out to talk to you. Otherwise, you're going to get so triggered, you're going to vote for a man that wants to torch U.S. democracy. Okay? Jesus fucking Christ. <sighs> okay. Back to rhetorical mode. Back to effective mode. <laughs> I have to say, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> that was like, and I've got so much sympathy for him. Like, because I think that really illustrates a lot of what he is trying to engage in and doing, but also the genuine frustration. Right. Marjorie Taylor Greene gets a lot of uh, media attention, but she has no political effectiveness by and large because she refuses to bend to the particular code of people who dominate our, our political elites. Right? Marjorie Taylor Greene is a classic example of someone who refuses to speak the code of those who make the most important political decisions. Tradition, right? That he let, I mean, he didn't let slip. <laughs> he intentionally, <laughs> intentionally expressed that. But, but everything he said there, I have huge sympathy for him. And he's right in everything, right? But it, it also speaks to the fact that he... He finds it extremely frustrating that he has to be so careful around right-wing people in order not to, you know, make yep. them scurry away. So I would expect that most of my audience is right-wing, and you don't think of people on the right wing being a bunch of snowflakes. But we all have vulnerabilities, right? Different people have different gifts, different grifts, different vul vulnerabilities, different flaws, different hero systems. So for people on the right, the greatest threats are contagion and invasion. And for people on the left, the greatest threats are you know, ignorance and uh, lack of education and any kind of uh, uh, group bigotry based on race and, and religion. So, yeah, that's... Yeah, that, 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 that was very enjoyable. Um, a good demonstration of his rhetorical skills, apart from being, I think, yeah, totally right. And question in the chat, why did the elites reject the, the Great Barrington Declaration? So I don't recall the wording, but I suspect in, the wording was not in accordance with how elites prefer their arguments made. And then second, I think it uh, failed on, on a factual basis. So effectively, the Great Barrington Declaration and seems to be the dominant American conservative pundit reaction to, to COVID was to disparage the value of social distancing and government regulation to encourage and enforce social distancing and other transmission reducing measures such as wearing masks. So, so from, from elite perspective, the Great Barrington Declaration was about you know, let, let everyone catch COVID except for a, a tiny percentage of you know, highly vulnerable people. They should be walled off and kept separate from, from the, the general population, but otherwise there's nothing wrong with, uh, with non-vulnerable people catching COVID. We will you know, burn through the virus more quickly and we will get to return to normal life. From the elite perspective, this was a platform for mass death and mass suffering and for, for mass injury and for overwhelming healthcare facilities. 
I would side with the elites on this perspective, right? I, I think even though I wasn't supporting social distancing at the time, I was not opposing it either. I was, I was agnostic on what was the way to go. I, I now, in retrospect, wish that I'd been more supportive of social distancing until we had the COVID vaccines. I believe that uh, most measures of social distancing in reaction to COVID were the wise way to go. In, in being frustrated about that particular thing, just remind me never to debate destiny. Not that that's ever going to happen <laughs> yeah. in this world. But well, that's... Yeah. I mean, he uses, you know, there as well, you hear him say, retalk. Right. That's the first time that I recall a member of uh, Decoding the Guru saying, I, I don't want to debate somebody. I mean, that's how formidable a debate of destiny is. Hard and stuff like that, right, as well. But again, I think that's just part of that whole culture there that, you know, you're just using edgy language to make the point. But it's not, and even in the case here, I don't feel like this is like Red Scare, where with Red Scare, I feel that they are constantly smirking to themselves that they're saying retard or whatever. But like with Destiny, it feels more like, no, that's just the way he communicates and yeah. whenever he's talking to people. And for good or bad, you can regard that as like, but he is not intending it as like, I think it's not as performative. It's more a genuine component of gamer streamer culture, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, a genuine expression of emotion that uh, he was talking to there. Uh, well, look, he's definitely, I'm going to call it right now. We're early in, it's early days, but he's definitely a lot smarter, frankly, than Red Scare mm. or Hassan for that matter. Oh, yeah. Um, or, or other people of this generation that we've covered. Um, I think that, I think even Destiny's most trenchant critics would have to concede that. Well, just, I will say though, Matt, like Destiny's 35. <laughs> so, so, you know, he's, he's pretty much in. It's, that's not just that a whippersnapper. Off, that's right. a whip, whippersnapper, Chris. <laughs> yeah. whippersnapper. He's only, only five years younger than me, but the, like, but fine, put him in the younger yeah. generation. You, you, you've got an, you you've got an old soul. You've got an old soul, <laughs> yeah. Chris. <laughs> you do. Yeah. Yeah. I played StarCraft 2. All right. <laughs> I played that. I, I just wasn't as good. Um, but. Yeah, so let me play another clip then. Maybe let's go out of edgy stuff just for a bit. We'll get back to it. Don't worry. We'll get back to it. But I'm going to let Destiny give a little description of his origin story. And this is him in a, what is it, Institute of Ideas interview that he was giving, talking about like where he comes from. So you used to stream games on Twitch, and more recently, well, over the past few years, you went more into the arena of political commentary. Can you tell us what initiated this shift? I've been playing games on Justin TV, which would become Twitch TV, I think around 2013, mm -hmm. um, from anywhere from, I think, around 2010, 2011, up to 2016. When the Trump stuff started to kick off, I saw all the conversations happening, and I thought I'd... So I was just thinking about the earlier interactions in the in the chat between Curious Gazelle and uh, Stephen J. James, and, and just thinking this is a class clash, right? Curious Gazelle speaks with an upper class, you know, elite accent, and Stephen J. James speaks in a working class accent. So for many people in Britain's upper class, as soon as they hear an accent like Stephen J. James, they immediately think this guy's an idiot. This guy's boring. I want nothing to do with wasting my time listening to him. But Stephen J. James has a lot of thoughtful, funny perspectives on life. But we, we tend to react based on cues. And, and one of the cues that we tend to react to is accent. And so people who speak in that upper class British accent, right, even Americans are very tempted to immediately think that this person's very smart even when they're saying ridiculous things. And then when people with a British working class accent like Stephen J. James say smart things, because he does it with a working class accent, many people think it's just uh, stupid. So let's get uh, Curious Gazelle onto the show. Curious Gazelle, do you think that there was possibly a class component to your reaction to Stephen J. James in that you have an elite accent and he has very much a working class accent? Um, no, 
uh, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, one is because uh, received pronunciation in the UK, it's no longer just limited to the so-called elites. Many people talk like me. In fact, if you go to East Anglia, uh, Cambridge, um, that sort of region in the UK, uh, Nottingham, everyone, including the working class people, will have uh, received pronunciation. So, and that is because the RP accent, it actually originates from that region. Wow. So you don't have, you don't react to a cue of the British the varieties of the British working class accent as like, here comes boredom. No. So the boredom was because he genuinely is quite boring. Um, and I just don't think he makes any interesting points. Um, I, I wouldn't really judge someone by their accent not just because oh i'm not an elitist or something but i'm a really good person no I, I just feel like i'm genuinely above that because um for a long time i i i, I taught myself how to think you know there was a time in my life where i was kind of religious as well and i guess once i started looking more critically into religion you learn you know the typical kind of logical fallacies and things like that right so you become a better thinker and it's just impossible to just kind of judge someone purely <clears throat> on the basis of their accent however can i just say i do judge chris cavanaugh a bit and tell me how so <laughs> <laughs> because it's it, he's, he just sounds so disgusting. He's like, ah, you sure hangy, like uh, it's it's <laughs> it actually hurts <laughs> listening to him, and, and and it's really ironic. So I guess I'm I'm being contradictory here because on the one hand I'm saying I don't judge people by their accent, um, and I'm also like doing this whole kind of apologist. Uh, defense of oh, the RP accent, it, uh, you know, the, the, the working class chaps can have it too in Britain. <laughs> and it's true, but I don't know why when it comes to Chris Kavanaugh, uh, Kavanaugh, is it Kavanaugh? How do you, how do you pronounce it? I think surname? it's Chris Kavanaugh, I think. Kavanaugh. Um, sorry, I was, I was thinking of the, um, the attorney general un under Trump. Uh, the the Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Sorry, uh, yeah. <laughs> Attorney General, yeah. still used to uh, uh, British uh, whatever's. Um, so yeah, so Chris Kavanaugh, I just yeah, I, I uh, it's just ironic that he talks like that. So he's decoding the gurus. He's he's the academic there. He, he's decoding people who are already quite smart. Um, I mean, he doesn't he doesn't decode people who are really dumb and low IQ. He's just decoding popular icons who are kind of considered quite smart by lots of different people. Right. So yeah. it's it's a difficult job, actually, because it's, it's easy to just criticize someone who's just so obviously wrong. Um, but what Chris Cavan is doing is quite difficult um because he really does have to think where these people are going wrong where their their arguments are fallacious um so i you know hats off to him he's he's working really hard and you're working even harder i think if we just go back to the accent thing for a second then i can compliment you on how hard you're working on this uh, decoding the decoders right yeah. um um so yeah, the, the accent is just, it really grates on you. So I, 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 do you know what? Once I listened to Chris Kavanagh's voice, I realized like I could understand why the mainstream mainland Brits used to hate these people. Like yeah. I finally understood it because I grew up with this notion that, oh, the Irish are so endearing and their and the Irish accent is so endearing as well. It's really nice, right? Um, and then I listened to him and I was like, what? Do people actually speak like this in Ireland, in the UK? Um, so that's that. I mean, maybe I'm being a bit mean, uh, which is why. I think you're being honest. I mean, I think we all yeah. react to cues because, because it's a decent enough heuristic to yeah. 
find it find out our way through life um i think i think chris kavanagh is a bit of a tatian i mean i love to use that word because it means many different things to me like uh, well it kind of means one thing like it's it's a single world view right um but many people fall under the category of tatism or they have aspects of andrew tate in them and i think talking in a brash way i think that's kind of tatian it suits andrew tate like when andrew tate does it i find that very attractive but when chris kavanagh does it and to be honest that's that is quite attractive but i don't i don't, i just don't associate it with um this kind of academic intellect he he should just he should have just been a rapper or something why is he why is he larping as an academic well you're kind of a, a high high low girl i mean you enjoy parts of mm. low lowbrow culture parts of highbrow culture i mean you you go up and yeah. down the spectrum well it's because of my very middle class upbringing i mean i may sound more uppity than i am but and i'm not just like uh doing this for to be sort of self-deprecating like i'm so middle class what am i actually like snow fucking rich you know um i i am pretty middle class so uh upbringing wise so um so yeah i can i can enjoy aspects of to be honest i, I much prefer low culture because it's just funnier i i don't really find um upper class people too funny i'll be honest have I think you... because humor is looked down upon uh, in those uh, in those spaces. Have you seen Saltburn, the 2023 movie? No, I have not. Uh, do you know anything about it? No, I, I do not know. It's about someone who's uncool at Oxford who gloms on to someone who's upper class and the very height of cool and then slowly worms his way into the, the hip group. Mm, that sounds really fascinating. I, did you like the movie? I did. I did. It wasn't mm -hmm. easy. It, it's kind of shocking, but but it, it's great. Like I love that kind of theme. Who's uh, who is in the movie? Um, I will I will give you the the names in a second. So it's a a thriller comedy, black comedy, psychological thriller, uh, directed, written by Emerald Fennell, starring Barry Keegan, Jacob Elordi, Rosamund Pike, Richard Grant, Alison Oliver, and Archie mm -hmm. Medekwe. Set in Oxford, it focuses on a student at Oxford who becomes fixated with a popular aristocratic fellow student who later invites him to spend the summer at his eccentric family's estate. Well, I mean, I think that sort of explains my fixation with my ex, who I call Morrison. Mm. It's quite eccentric, but we can't talk about that no, right no, now. Not, um, but what about have because, you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I I just want to carry on the Chris Kavanaugh thing yes. for a second. Um, I uh, it it is kind of off putting when I listen to him speak. Uh, but then at the same time, he he does crack a lot of jokes. What do you think? I've not I've not actually listened to too much of his stuff. Uh, but I intend to do so, not directly, but via you. I want to listen to your entire series that you've done so far. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, so I, 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 I think, I think, I know, I think what you've managed to do is actually some of the greatest content is in the history of mankind. And I'm not even exaggerating because to, to analyze people who are already analyzing other people and a lot of those people that they're analyzing also are sort of analysts you know jordan peterson who's, he's not an original thinker of some sort he is dependent on carl jung and you know he's derivative right most, most people are yeah. today so like you are analyzing the analysis of the analysis of the analysis of the analysis yes that's what i'm so trying you to are do. a supreme being <laughs> that's what i'm trying to do like i'm trying to add value to, to intellectual discourse and you add value primarily by making something clearer that was mm -hmm. previously not clear. So if there's anything I can do to provide the, the most effective mm. analysis of the analysis of the analysis, that's what I'm, that's what I strive to do, to, to mm. try to make mm. something more clear and, and move beyond 
the received wisdom. Mm. But also, you you operate at a quite at a at a more um, at at a different level to most people, and most people are thinking in binaries. So even Chris Kavanagh and who's his co-host? Uh, I forgot uh, Matt, Arthur Dent. Matthew is it? Brown, oh, who uses Matthew, the name Matthew Brown. Arthur Dent on Twitter. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So I thought they were two different people, which is why I got confused. They are. Matt Brown is from Australia. He's the, oh, yeah, no, yeah, oh. so, but, but he uses the Twitter persona, Arthur Dent, but that is Matt Brown, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, uh, regarding these two individuals, or I'll just sort of hyper-focus on Chris Kavanaugh because it's easier. I mean, he's approaching things from uh, a very atheistic lens, even if he won't admit that he's a pure atheist and even though he'll start like criticizing the new atheists for being a bit racist and dismissive of religion blah 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 but he's not religious himself whereas you can operate at a, at a level of of actually uh, you can operate at a purer form of rationality because uh, you you recognize that uh, believing in god can be very rational right and uh, you also recognize that um, an atheist can have a very high level of rationality as well. So you're not bound by belief and disbelief like they are. Um, and they're not so obviously bound by this, but I sense it. And it definitely when, when it comes to you analyzing their analysis, you can see the difference because you will, you will stop in places and you will say, well, Actually, you know, in some ways, religion can be quite helpful. It is, uh, it, it can have an evolutionary advantage. It can bring um, peace to someone's life and organization. And, you know, so you, you can kind of functionalize religion, whereas um, their analysis kind of stops at a certain point. And they are, they are kind of nitpicking, I feel, at, at, at right wing thinkers yeah i don't know i don't know if you see that i mean then one could argue well luke Wardle is also nitpicking at chris cavanaugh but that's not really what you're doing because there isn't that kind of ad hominem there uh yeah. whereas um whereas i think with <clears throat> with chris cavanaugh um there is a kind of agenda there is an axe to grind uh so uh, and and he can't kind of uh, get rid of that reflexive uh, disgust ick that he feels towards a lot of the people that he's analyzing. Um, and uh, what you tend to do is you you humanize the people that they are analyzing uh, by saying that mm, well, you know, it's what Jordan Peterson, for example, does is only human. Other other people do this as well, right? So. Um, and and I think you go beyond humanizing as well, which is you, you can actually see where maybe Jordan Peterson has a serious point, which actually overrides what overrides Chris Kavanaugh's uh, criticism. Yeah, that's that's so what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to really do. Really impressed. Well, thank you, thank you so so much. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do because I guess my my primary critique of uh, Chris Kavanaugh and Matthew Brown is that they don't recognize the arbitrary partisan nature of their own particular hero system because it is the water in which they swim. So just like someone who lives their life within Orthodox Judaism and they take for granted that hero system, so too Matthew Brown, Chris Kavanaugh, and other members of the, the Academy live within a particular hero system that, that valorizes a particular approach to life around harm reduction, around idea of a, a buffered identity so that we, in our own buffer, we can create uh, morality and, and meaning for ourselves without regard to the mm. community, this, mm. this very individualist perspective on life that we are, we're all essentially primarily individuals with certain inalienable rights. Mm. And I, I would strongly argue against that. I would say that we are best understood as being members of families, extended families, tribes and, and communities and, and nations, and that we primarily get uh, our our direction and our hero system from our tribe from our community and it's usually not something that's that's thought through and they've joined a particular community with a particular hero system and 
they don't seem to uh, give much thought to how the particular water in which they're swimming is taken for granted by them as the most heroic approach to life. They see it as objective and empirical, and I see it as another partisan uh, mm. hero system that is underlain by you know particular acts of faith to provide meaning to their life, just like a member of Orthodox Judaism has engaged in the same sort of partisan mm. uh, leap of faith to create meaning for, for their life. Yeah, and, and in the same way that Chris Cavanaugh and his co-hosts are pretty partisan as well. <laughs> and, um, perhaps not exactly in the same way. Um, I think it's also kind of hypocritical, uh, or sorry, and I wouldn't call it hypocrisy, but it's, or perhaps it is, but it's, incons it's inconsistent that Chris Cavanaugh is very much okay with like other um, hero systems in other uh, he, he, sorry he's okay with hero systems in other cultures so like if he goes off to japan i think he's doing some research project in japan he's he he, he treats all of the kind of uh japanese irrationality with a lot of uh respect yes uh and actually from a from a pure reason perspective that irrationality might be even more irrational than Jordan Peterson, right? From a, if, if you yes. want to be completely, you know, uh, honest here. Um, so that, that poses a major inconsistency in the, uh, there's, there's a hole in his methodology there. Right. I don't feel like they notice the water that they're, they're swimming in. And and so what one one way to get an insight into the host of decoding the gurus is that on on a show just for Patreons they mention for each of them their greatest fear. What do you imagine their their greatest fear is professionally? Sorry, if you just repeat that question to me, what their fear is professionally? Did you yeah, give a context what's their greatest, for that question? What is their greatest fear with regard to their podcast? Like what are the what are the direct possible consequences as a result of their podcast that they have the Nothing. most visceral. No, no. Their greatest Nothing. fear is emails to their dean. So if they get emails to their dean complaining about something that they said on the show, mm, that mm, is the most mm. likely to create turbulence in the most important professional right, area but of their life. But they, but they know that, that no one will complain about them because they, they genuinely are ideologically aligned with the left and even if they kind of push the boundaries of uh academic discourse they're still within the confines of the right politics yeah yeah so they've got the, the so right politics they, they've know. Got, they share the hero system and so they are largely immune from cancel is a not just cancel being cancelled but they're immune from the turbulence that, that makes life so upsetting and difficult if you fall mm. out of alignment with the group that is the primary source of meaning and purpose and heroism in your life that makes your life incredibly painful but they are immune from that because they stay you, within the liberal left bubble mm -hmm, but do you think they, that they genuinely are living in fear and that's why they do things because i think it's become so second nature to them to be on the left that they're not really stuck in a fear-based system like you could ultimately call all fat forms of morality mob morality where you're doing things for the group um however if you just go if you kind of discard that for a second i don't think um what they're doing is just for the group like they genuinely believe in what they believe in yeah i i agree with that i would say that they have a normal functional amount of, of fear. That uh, that the fear is is a should should play a functional role in everyone's life, and that is whatever is most precious to you. You should have fear of anything that threatens that. And their professional standing, their professional stature, their professional mm. life is the thing next to their their family that I, I would suspect is the most precious thing in their life. And so. You should rationally be concerned about anything. Well, that the, would the the most it. the most the most precious thing in their life seems to be that podcast. I think Chris Kavanaugh will eventually start showing signs of 
the guru complex himself. I mean, I, you've probably done that. You did that decoding Chris Kavanaugh uh, episode, didn't you? Yeah. And I think I, I mentioned this emphasis that, you know, their greatest fear is falling out of alignment with their their academic uh, peers. I, I'm not sure that they will they will voluntarily leave academia. I think they they get a great deal of sustenance from their, their life in academia. Can I can I say this that um I think their greatest fear in the more immediate sense, uh so not something that's subconscious, which is the the fear of, you know, falling out of line. Um or I don't know if that's subconscious. I, it's it's hard to categorize it exactly but um i think what they really fear is um being seen as hypocrites they do fear that ultimately they might become what all the people they are analyzing right now became because a lot of the people they analyze on their podcast they didn't start off as gurus right so a lot of them started off as genuine um academically minded individuals and then as as their fame kind of kept going up um they they lost their mind kind of went off the rails yeah i wouldn't say lost their mind but just kind of went off the rails a little a little bit yeah Yeah. depending on who again i've not watched all the episodes so i can't really name the people that they're analyzing off the top of my head i mean you're, you're doing destiny today who i mean they're not they're not being fair to destiny actually what do you think well i think that they have been <laughs> fair to destiny because I, I listened to the the whole thing i mean destiny has to be understood in this particular genre he's a live streamer and people go to live streams for a spectacle and a discourse that they can't get in the mainstream media and so a live streamer should be judged by different standards than say an academic so I don't think that what you articulated is their greatest fear. I don't think it's even one of their top five because uh, both well, of them. It's because seem... they'll lose the the reason. They'll lose, um, yeah, they'll lose the exact reason for their podcast. Right, but she, uh, they are firmly rooted in their academic disciplines. So people who are <laughs> insecure have signs that give away their insecurity. And I don't see any signs of them feeling insecure about tipping into becoming gurus themselves. Mm. Right. So if um, I go ahead. No, I, I can't actually remember what exactly I was going to say. You, no, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So if, if my uh, greatest fear was um, crossing the orthodoxy in Orthodox Jewish community, then that would be easy to spot. If uh, my greatest fear was losing, say, my friendship with Nathan Kofnis, you know, people would pick that up. So people's greatest vulnerability and greatest fear usually becomes fairly apparent. And what, what's apparent to me with regard to decoding the gurus is that their greatest fear is they very much want to stay within the good graces of their respective academic communities. And I don't see any signs of their greatest fear being the one that you articulated. Okay, well, I, I disagree with you. Great. That's, that's why it's good to have you on and get a, get a different, <laughs> different perspective. I think they do fear then, and that fear pushes them to keep making content that's highly analytical. I mean, m- many academics... <clears throat> have started off quite genuine and gone off the rails a bit. Uh, like, I don't know. Would you would you include Jonathan Haidt in that category? Because he's he's bit. not like a Chris. He's yeah. I he's not like a Chris Kavanaugh. He's more like a a pop psychologist. Uh, he's more like a public intellectual. So public intellectual is different from the guru in that the guru. Uh, opines on all sorts of areas of life where they don't necessarily know much, a public intellectual Mm. will use his standing in a particular part of the academic arena. So a a public intellectual will have genuine academic accomplishments, and then he will use that status to comment on things that are related to his area of status. And so that's what I see Jonathan Haidt doing. Now, I think Haidt has... Uh, fallen into some of the vulnerabilities. I really that like, come, yeah. 
I really yeah. like how you use the term status, by the way, because I know it's used in evolutionary biology quite a bit or evolutionary psychology, <clears throat> but I feel like um, like Brits um, mostly talk about class, uh, Marxists talk about power, but really what's at play is status, right? So yeah. that is a much better term to use. Um, and I'm really glad that you use it with such ease and don't shy away from it. Um, it is a very Tatian thing to do, by the way, because he talks about status a lot. I know the context is a bit crass because it's, you know, high status males and low status males and, you know, high body count, and low body count. But, you know, whenever Tate has shown uh, moments of intellectual brilliance, um, he, he, you know, he still conceptualizes things into this kind of status paradigm and um it's just it's just it's it's kind of just hidden away from us in in britain because people like hyperventilate when they talk about class and that's the only word they use but to say but to call something low status just to say like oh you you um lady um with those drawn on uh, eyebrows it's a very low status thing to do um <laughs> People just don't say these things when it's just the reality. Yeah, and honestly, I've always looked to make a contribution and status is perhaps the number one area of life mm. that is the most important that does not mm. get mm. Uh, honest attention. People would rather yeah. disclose the number of STDs they have than the yeah. amount of effort they yes. go into to get higher status. Indeed, indeed. It's fascinating. I mean, the Quran has a, has, a, has a line about status. I can't remember the exact chapter in the verse because I, I don't have the, um, the hard copy of the Quran in front of me right now either. Um, but it is that, um, indeed, it is God who gives status. He is the status giver. And so you see that um, modern Muslims have, have kind of retranslated that as power. And yeah. it just doesn't work. It doesn't work if you translate it like that because, um, or, or like, um, I, I can't really tell you why it doesn't work. It's just kind of intuitive as to why I think you get it. I don't know if, if, if the listeners will understand, but, but we're just socialized against using this term, it seems. <laughs> it's because too shameful. Right. People would mm, rather yeah. disclose uh, h how many people they, they've slept with, they'd rather disclose how, suffering from diarrhea than to yeah. disclose uh, their the amount of effort they've made into improving their status. I think aside from, mm. from meeting one's survival needs, I think after that, the single biggest driving force in people is to improve their social standing. In other words, to reduce mm. the chances of social humiliation and increase mm. the, the chances of being socially approved and looked up to. So aside from mm. our raw basic survival needs, I see people as being primarily driven by the desire mm. to avoid social humiliation and to advance in social status. Mm. Well, can I give you a, another example of um, a reference to status? Um, so I was, I was listening to, uh, sorry, uh, a, a, a hidden reference to status rather, where the, where the word was um, changed, right? Um, so I was listening to um, Cindy Yu, who is a journalist for The Spectator, um, and she runs a podcast called the Chinese Whispers Podcast. She, she sort of focuses on China um, for The Spectator magazine. And um, so she was in, in, in an interview with uh, Coleman Hughes, and uh, she's like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's only people who have power in the discourse who should really uh, speak right and I and I thought <laughs> just just say status <laughs> right <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean power in the discourse why does it why does it have to be this kind of Marxist social science sort of term right in fact it's not even really social science it's, it's more voodoo than than anything I mean status is more reality based yeah yeah I mean who does not yearn to minimize social humiliation I mean but for whom is social humiliation not among the most painful experiences of their life? Like, who, who does not hate being fired 
who does not like uh, being you know exposed to the people who are most important to you as some kind of defect or, or loser i think we all fear that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we all know what it's like to be treated depending on our status level we all know what it's like to be considered uh, higher status than than average and we, we know the amount of uh, superior treatment we get when we're perceived as higher status and we know the crap that gets shoveled at us when we're perceived as low status mm. which is why i think um uh people who get into fitness are kind of buffering the effects of um sorry i was gonna say being <laughs> being low status <laughs> I mean, it's true. A lot of people become fixated <laughs> yeah. with, with fitness to try to overcome the humiliation. It's their way of dealing with the humiliation of being low status. I, I know that that, that worked no, for me. No, but I think I, it's a good technique. It's a very good, te it's a very good thing to do. Right. I know you, you do the Alexander technique. <laughs> Which is the gayest thing ever. I, but <laughs> No, I really like it. I watched some of your videos where you're like, just kind of helping people balance uh, and, and I, I, I really admire you Luke um you're a really good person and you you do run an excellent live stream and uh you're a very honest critical thinker uh without um w without actually appearing loserish while at it like you really do have a kind of aura about you oh thank thank you um I, I, I think I, I know this is true for, for my life at, at times that when we have a problem such as we feel low status, we, we, we choose something that we think is the solution that is completely removed from anything that is likely to be the solution. So, for example, for people who are low status, and I have felt that at times and it has driven me into athletic exertion. So, uh, at one point in my life, I ran five marathons. At other point in my life, I dedicated myself to sit ups and push ups to, to build out my. But physique. that's very good. But that's very good. Did you did you feel as if uh, you you'd regain some status, well, confidence, really? Uh, I did, but there that. would have been much more effective ways to go. If if I would have found some way of dealing with the the fundamental issue, which was my own relationship to myself rather than seeking to externalize this issue into push-ups, sit-ups, and long-distance running, I would have been much more effective. So sit-ups and push-ups, yeah, it made me feel a little better about myself, but it didn't get close to addressing the, the fundamental problem that was causing my misery. And, and that is my lack of, of ability to be a good friend to myself. I would instead rotate between an exaggerated sense of my own capability and importance and a complete sense of despair and self-hatred. And so either approach to myself was not adaptive and I would have been much mm. better if I had put my efforts into learning to become a, a better friend to myself as opposed to just working out. Like it's so much more tempting to do these external things like working out or learning a new language or you know mixing with a new social class or getting a new job or moving to a new location or going to a new church or joining a new religion right it, it's so tempting to do the geographic to do this externalization this this appealing uh delusion that we have that will deal with our biggest source of pain rather than dealing with the biggest source of pain by something that has a significant chance of working which is usually mm. going down to your relationship to yourself, which then shows itself in your relationship to other people. But as long as mm. you're unable to be a friend to yourself or these other external missions are not going to shift the quality of your life. Mm. Well, do you think um, your uh, feeling of, of being lower status beyond the kind of personal relationship you have with yourself, do you think that is something to do with uh, you coming from a very kind of elite background. I've actually forgotten what your what your exact background is, like socioeconomic status wise. Uh, do you think it's just it's harder for you because like the expectations are more like I'm from a pretty middle class background. My parents are both professionals. Um, 
Uh, my dad is a doctor, actually. Um, but in the UK, uh, it's a kind of uh, middle class profession. It's not got the same kind of status uh, as in the US, right? Um, and so uh, there's just, I don't feel this incredible pressure to uh, be, you know, some whatever top X, Y, Z person in life. Like, I mean, I mean, I shouldn't be going the opposite way either, but, but the, but the pressure is when, if you're from a middle-class family, it's, it's not too, um, difficult pressure-wise because the expectations aren't like, wow, you should be making, uh, 1 million by the age of 30. Are you there? Hello? Our delusions and it reduces us to who we really are. And so I think the dominant thing that has led to my, my pain over low status has not been the, the disproportionate success of my father in, in one area of life. It's been what we'll, I'll just call ADHD, giving me all sorts of impulses that lead to a pattern of behavior that most people would call general weirdness. So when you're weird, you're off-putting to other people. You are causing other people discomfort, and so they naturally distance themselves from you. And so because I, I was bombarded by an ADHD physiology, it would express itself, despite the best of my efforts, as a general weirdness that people would distance themselves from, which left me ineffective, uh, lonely, and low status. And I, I think this is true because once I got on ADHD medication, I noticed that 90% that of these maladaptive impulses just uh, melted away. But there, there are many people in my life who would echo your critique. They'd say that the main thing that's driven me is a, is a desire to you know, struggle with my father's legacy and level of success. Whoops, I uh, lost a Curious Gazelle. Did you hear anything I, that I was saying? What? So I don't know uh, what happened. I think my connection uh, was a bit uh, crappy there. But uh, yeah, so I, I heard the last bit. So it's a, uh, that you, um, your, your friends and family think that you struggled to sort of meet the expectations of your dad's legacy. Um, but the fact that you make it also psychological and, and personalize it so much as in you think it's to do with your own ego your own self do you think that is a sort of admirable evasion in the same way that you know people are more willing to admit uh, that they've got stds than just saying well actually i don't have a job mate and i'm i'm pretty low status well, i think what's most important is is what's true and so what's true maybe what you said that may be the, the primary uh, challenge that has deformed me, but that's mm. not how I experience life. When, when I experience life being on my ADHD medication seems to make all the dissonant forces in my, in my physiology mute themselves. So it becomes very little effortful to stay harmonious with the people around me. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, there can be many levels of truth, right? So mm -hmm. the, the psychological level is, is one is, is one level, then of course, um, is one level of truth. And then of course, the socioeconomic status thing, uh, your, your dad's legacy, etc, your sort of family history biography, that that is another level of truth. So they're not necessarily at odds with one another. Um, however, I do think that you're... Yes, you're still there. Oh, you got you got muted. So. Sorry, I there. couldn't. I couldn't see your. I couldn't see your. Um, 
profile so that I thought you'd sort of close the space or something. No, 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 I just um, shifted. Okay. Um, yes, but I do, I do. Do you want to carry on talking for a bit more or are you, are you tired? You must have, this has gone on for four no, hours. I'm, I I'm really enjoying it. I mean, I've got a friend coming over in 10, 20 minutes, but until then I, I'd like to, I'd like to continue. Uh, I think we could agree that for some people, the main challenge to them having an effective mm. life is physiological. For other people, it's mm. psychological. For other people, it's spiritual. For some people, it's religious. No, this is all cope. This is all what cope. Do you you'd, you'd literally, you'd do it. You'd, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go back on what I said. Like the whole, oh, there are different levels of truth. There is the physiological. There is the psychological. There is the family biography one. I, I just think it's just cope. You're kind of, you're kind of doing what you're accusing others of doing. The, you know, you, you uh, to to a to uh, on a on a smaller level, you are doing what the people who go on about STDs do. Wait, I I, I think it, it's obvious that some people primarily that their biggest struggle in life is physiological. For other people, their biggest struggle in life is economic. For other people, their mm. biggest struggle in life is psychological. Uh, for other people, uh, well, biggest... I would I would say it all. It's un unless it's like a serious uh, illness, right, which you can't control. I think all of these things are under the banner of status, which people just don't want to talk about. Right, but to be effective, third in world fighting... cultures do though. Third world culture. I'm sorry, I cut you off there. No, go ahead. To be effective, uh, so I was going to say third world cultures are very open about this term status i mean even in india you've got a caste system but that caste system has been mistranslated as caste right but by by the british so the correct uh translation would be a status system i mean it is okay i, I guess I'm, I'm stretching it a bit because it is a caste system in that you know these are very kind of rigid uh groups to which people belong and they can't necessarily come out of but before uh the brits came in and i'm not i'm not just doing this to like moan about uh, an empire or something i'm thinking empire is quite amazing in many ways but i'm just saying this in a matter of fact way that before the, the brits came in before uh the car system was properly kind of codified um you could uh, the, well the the caste system was very fluid actually and it wasn't really a caste system it was a, it was a kind of status system and that and and i think empire brought with it uh different different castes with it itself right so the the various kind of classes in india today um they have roots in uh, the caste system so to speak but also like the colonial uh, class system so it's a bit of a mix and uh, ultimately it's all just it's all just status games right um yeah, yeah i i, I, say, I think that the pursuit of status is the strongest drive after survival so i, I agree with you mm. also agree that in different circumstances different things will lead to status. So if you're mm -hmm. a villager in rural East Africa, right, what will lead to status is, is very different from what will lead to status if you get a scholarship and go to Oxford University. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What do you think about- But then my... it's, all, it's, all, it's, also, it's also relative to the area to which you belong as well, right? So if you do graduate from oxbridge in the uk it's really not that elite anymore um it's not like a, oh my god really sort of thing um it, it doesn't ha it doesn't carry the same weight as, as having a sort of ivy league education in the us um so uh, so these two examples that you've given with the with the guy in the village and the Ox Oxford graduate, I feel um, they're both relative to whichever society uh, they sort of fit into. Yeah, it all depends on which community is most important to you. Which 
which people do you most want to give you status? So let's say that I was primarily concerned with the opinions of philosophers and that I, I mm-hmm. put 10 times more importance on the opinion of philosophers because a lot of my friends are professional philosophers. And let's just say mm. I put 10 times more importance on the opinions of philosophers compared to every other person or group in my life. Then I would speak philosopher code words, code language. I would orient my arguments to make them philosophically inviting and, and precise. And that's what would predominantly shape what, what I say publicly. Uh, on the other hand, if the group that I most want status from is Orthodox Jews, then I would primarily use that code language and embody that value system and speak mm. in a way that aligns with Torah. If I primarily wanted status just from professionals, then I would try to use the code words and the value system that dominates among dentists, accountants, uh, doctors, and uh, lawyers. So mm. we, we all want status, uh, but we often want status from completely different groups. And so I, I'm part of, of many different groups. I'm, I'm part of the Orthodox Jewish community. I'm part of a live streaming group. I'm part of a, a right wing community. I'm part of a, a philosopher community. So mm-hmm. I, I want status from all these different groups. And so my yearning for status will affect how I speak. Yeah, and and you're absolutely right there. And you you can also um, you can also look at this sort of cult of POC politics. So persons of color or people of color, um, you could you could look at this style of politics from the lens of status as well. So a lot of these people they may come off as very brash to the Westerners, but and they might come off come off as a very kind of leftist and marxist and you know they might come off as anti-status right because they're not placating um norms within you know traditional sort of western politics right that they should be placating they should be living up to so that they can get status right um but so the reason they behave like this is because their status is dependent on their on their their ethnic sort of communities yeah i gotta gotta run my my friend just uh pulled up so i enjoy talking to you but i don't want to keep him waiting okay okay lovely speaking to you luke good to talk to you